you know, it's funny, these progressives, these woke, they're into critical race theory, uh, white privilege, uh, God knows what, woke, transgender, cut your balls off, become a girl, be a woman, become a guy. This is so, I mean, this is so, fuck, this is so fucking crazy. Not only that, it's also, you know, talk about, you talk about Epstein? Okay, you are Epstein with the young girls? These doctors and whoever who are mutilating five-year-olds, ten-year-olds, and taking the parents, you know, that now that that is what is that? That's crime against children. That's that's worse than what Epstein. Awesome. So Jack, um, so we stopped sort of 20 years ago. Um, so we said that you know, 20 years went past from 53. We're now somewhere around 73, and you're a young assistant professor at San Diego um, on tenure track sort of fully unaware of some of the more paranormal things um, that happened when you were a teenager and you move in with a buddy of yours who's an associate professor at San Diego as well. Um, and so the story now continues from there. Where are we in your life? What's going on afterwards? Uh, well, well, we finished We finished where I get to SRI, I think. Uh, just to review, uh, I'm uh, supposed to be leaving for... Um, Trieste, Italy, Abdus Salam invited me to the International Center for Theoretical Physics in right. Trieste, Italy, which is the uh, which was kind of a, a meeting place for the Soviet Union, Africa, India, China, uh, Europe, America, and it was a well-known, you know, it's full of intelligence agencies from you know UNESCO, International Atomic Energy Authority ran it. And it was kind of a place, like a place where scientists from all the different countries, including from behind the Iron Curtain, it was the Cold War, it was, you know, 1970s. Cold War was pretty hot. But nevertheless, they had this kind of place to meet. And um, if you uh, see the movie, The Recruit, I think it's called The Recruit with uh, Robert De Niro, he's a CIA guy. And the recruit, they said the recruit was kind of like <laughs> over to Trieste. And this, so this physics, the physics institute in Trieste is in the movie as being kind of a, you know, a, uh, a Cold War place where all the spooks kind of interact. Everybody's trying to see what the other people are doing. But it's. Yeah. So if I may interject. Yeah. You know, <laughs> that's what I said to 73. Yes. Yeah, so oh, you but. You mentioned your time but, at Trieste and with Abdul Salam, but. You never really mentioned what you did there. What 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 was what did you spend some of your time there doing? Because you mentioned, you know, in, yeah, with Abu Salam. Yeah. Well, in, well, and Trieste was working on uh, the well, a couple of things, but the F gravity, which is kind of like uh, when Modern Bob Lazar thing. talks about gravity A, gravity B. In other words, it was what's called the pi, a bimetric theory. Okay, what happens in general relativity is basically, if you look at Feynman's lectures, Richard Feynman's lectures, Caltech lectures on gravitation, he tries to build up Einstein's classical general relativity from what's called the spin to tensor quantum field theory on flat space. And, and uh, you have all these things, these Feynman diagrams, and it turns out the curved space-time classical geometry that Einstein did in 1915, Feynman gets that by summing an infinite number of his what are called tree diagrams without closed loops. So, so it's a okay. But the point is, what you have you have a particle, a graviton, a spin two graviton, like a spin one photon, okay, or a spin one half electron, or a spin one half uh, lepton, you know, things like that, uh, or spin one mesons. All these different particles. So, so, the, so gravity is like a particle called the graviton, the spin to graviton. But in vacuum, that graviton uh, has a very weak coupling to matter, which is why you know um, uh, it was so much so difficult to measure gravitational waves from colliding black holes. You know, which is done. Kip Thorne and his group finally did it after many years of effort and many millions and millions of dollars using the. Uh, uh, the, the LIGO, the interferometer. So it's very hard to measure these things. Uh, but uh, I independently, and Salam also had the idea that uh, maybe there's like a strong gravity inside the nucleus from a, from a spin to what's called the F meson, spin to meson. 
So there'd be like two different separate gravity fields. There's this the spin to at, at the 10 to the minus 13 centimeter level or 10 minus 15 meters called the Fermi level, which is uh, even, le even a little less than that. Then, so there'd be the second strong gravity field which is you know 10 to the 40 times stronger than the other gravity field. Curiously enough, Lazar, I didn't realize that Lazar in the 1980s is talking about this in his kind of you know informal way without you know somebody told him about this stuff. He didn't have the right language. He's not talking like a theoretical physicist, but he's talking about there's like a strong gravity at the nuclear level. And that's what I was working on. Now the advantage of that is. The advantage of that is that uh, you can then think of um, of, uh, of quarks, let's say, quarks and electrons as little rotating black holes, what are called Kerr, Kerr, Newman, and well, I'm right, they also have electric charge. So they have charge and spin, they're rotating uh, like little black holes. And if they're extremal, what are called extremal black holes, then uh, you don't have to worry about them radiating, the, you know, the Hawking radiation, they, they, they're, they're kind of stable. But you, you just upset that a little bit, then they decay, and a lot of particles do decay. So it was a part the ambulance outside. We have all these homeless people lying in the streets, and they have to pick them up off the ground, like shit on the ground, like bleeding. <laughs> I'm exaggerating. But my neighborhood is actually, you know, I live in a very exclusive neighborhood. But right down below me is where all the crap is. <laughs> it's, it's all right, sorry about that. So where was it? Oh, yes, the strong F gravity. So, and then the reason uh, I was interested in it back at San Diego State, uh, and also uh, Susskind was working on this stuff too, uh, the string theory, this was string theory, hadronic string theory, not the latest string theory, but the 26 dimensions, the 11 dimensions, and M, M theory, all that bullshit. Not, not that, I'm not talking about that. This was a more a conservative in, in ordinary space time where the hadrons like strings, but then the, the, the people notice that the, the string, okay, in fact, Lenny, it's a big idea, Lenny Susskind, <coughs> the string picture and the black hole picture, that's EPR equals ER, you know, that's, that's the hologram idea. So, so there's a correspondence between string pictures, picturing particles as little as vibrating strings <coughs> and as little black holes. And there was something called <coughs> called the Reggie trajectories. I forget now exactly how that works. What happens if you plot the uh, the spin of the of the strongly interacting particles called hadrons? You plot their spin versus the square of their mass. They lie on a straight line. Now it turns out that the rotating the Kerr solution, the little black holes, has the same kind of relationship. Now that's what I noticed. I think that I think, yeah, I don't know if anybody else noticed it, but I this Jack Sarfati thing. And I was communicating with uh, with Abdus Salam. So that's what he liked. He said he, he thought that was a good idea. And because of that, he called me up in San Diego and said, Jack, come, why don't you come to Trieste? So I know you're kind of free. I sort of been quit my job at that time anyway. I was working with Fred Wolf. I, I was actually no longer really at that point, 73. I think I quit in 71, but I went back to San Diego and I was working on Fred's Air Force military uh, nuclear bomb contract, a uh, blast, you know, nuclear blast. So, although um, I was still at San Diego, but I was no longer an official professor. It was on his Air Force contract. And I guess Salam knew that. He said, well, yeah, you know, you're not stuck there. Can you come over to Italy? So I'm sure, of course, you can come to Italy. <laughs> and uh, so that's why so I was working on what Bob Lazar roughly calls gravity A. Well, maybe it's gravity. Yeah, it's gravity B. I think it was Einstein or ordinary stuff. So I'm doing gravity A, except we call it F gravity. And it's Great. real. And yep. because of the Reggie trajectories. Okay. So, and also, in, uh, you see, in ordinary quantum mechanics, there are no real particles. See, that's the problem with the Copenhagen. There's what's called collapsing wave function. It's very, you know, it's very wishy-washy. It's, it's kind of stupid, actually. <clears throat> but in the Bohm approach, David Bohm, which, and I forgot to mention, I was with David Bohm in London in 1971, till we forgot about that, between 66 
in between. I was also in London and I was spending time with Abdus Salam then in 1971. So I first met Salam in 66. I was back in London for over a year in 71. And I was also interacting with going between, I was at Birkbeck College with, um, with Dave, uh, David Bohm. And oh, actually I was there also, Roger Penrose was there doing Twisters. I was sitting in on Penrose's thing. And, uh, and with Salam people over at Imperial. So I was schmoozing with them back and forth. So, and I, made, and, and I guess maybe that's what I learned about F gravity from, from Salam. So in any case, in 73, Salam invites me to go to Italy, okay? But as uh, we said last time, I guess we should go over some of this. You know, uh, I'm living with, with, with Fred Wolf, he invites his friend from Chicago, Bob Tobin. Bob Tobin starts telling us about Uri Geller, the Israeli psychic, who's really the Mossad. This is the, the Israeli intelligence aid, the Mossad, right? As it turns out, Uri Geller, little thing on Uri Geller. Uri Geller was a paratrooper in the 67 war with the Netanyahu brothers. You know, Bibi Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel, okay, was his was his buddy in, in combat with the two brothers. You know, the old, the other Netanyahu brother was later killed in the Entebbe raid, all that, which Uri Keller was involved with that too. So Uri Keller was a parrot, the, the elite paratrooper unit with the Netanyahu brothers in the 67. Well, he, he even got shot, he got wounded in the shoulder. Yeah, not, not bad. So the, these are, the, okay, so, um, so this whole thing with Uri Keller and the psychic stuff, this is the this is a, a Mossad thing is involved when the CIA and the Andrea Paharic brings all this whole thing is an intelligence operation. Okay, yeah, Jack, I need uh, to. Mac, that doesn't mean it's not real. That doesn't mean the powers don't exist, but okay, the so, intelligence is right there. Okay, go ahead. Do you want to say something? Yeah, I Did wanted want to, to say something. Yeah, but you clarified. I was just going to say that because you mentioned that Yuri Geller was a Mossad agent um, and a paratrooper with BB. Um, that you know, I don't want people to immediately assume that it's not true because of that, because both of those things can be true at the same time, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so one reason the Mossad was into it because they knew it was true, and the CIA knew it was true. In fact, I, I was told, you know, that the whole reason that the CIA it is was formed was because of the Roswell crash, the flying saucer crash, you know, other reasons too. But that was a big reason it was formed. And I also know that's true because the grandson of James Jesus Angleton, who's one of the guys who started the CIA at the, from the very beginning, was obsessed with the whole threat from flying sources, consistent with what Chris Mellon and Louis Elizondo are actually saying now, even though I don't get along with them at the moment. <laughs> you know, politics makes strange men that follows. We probably will get along in the future because they're not going to have a choice because I have the real physics and they can't do anything without me. So, you know, right now we're fighting. It, it's kind of like a, when Donald Trump, you know, fights with Ted Cruz, but then they, they all, you know, it's politics, just politics. Uh, you have to keep that apart from the physics. So uh, so there we are. So so this whole thing with Geller, and then, okay, and, and then what happened, but the spooky part, as you recall, <clears throat> is that I'm supposed to be going to Trieste on a Wednesday I'm up in Carmel Valley at my girlfriend's mother's house. And it's a Sunday morning. And uh, uh, Sharon's mother brings the San Francisco Chronicle in. I open up the magazine. It's a big spread about Uri Geller and all these paranormal tests at the Stanford Research Institute. And I said, my God, this is just exactly what, you know, Bob Tobin, who had come to San Diego, said he had plenty of money to pay us to come. He wants to write a book about this, this project. Here it is, I'm reading about the project, right? So uh, Monday morning comes, I pick up the phone, I call up there, this Irish guy named Brendan O'Regan gets on the phone and he says, Dr. Safati, we were hoping you would call us, which is pretty damn weird, right? It's happening. This is time, again, as I said last time, this is smoking gun evidence, time trap, the future, the higher intelligences, in fact, the ones that are controlling the Tic Tacs right now, that are uh, doing to the U.S. Navy whatever they feel like doing, saying to the U.S. Navy, you know, fuck you, you can't touch us. You know, we have superior technology. Right? This, this is the meaning of this, right? That's the meaning of it. And these, 
these flying saucers, they're able to neutralize our nuclear weapons. So if Putin had this, we're, we're done. Well, we're finished anyway. Yeah, you know, I mean, but uh, yeah, if Putin had this technology and we didn't have this technology, uh, you know, then we might as well surrender. But the point is, Putin doesn't have it either because if Putin had it, he wouldn't have invited me to Moscow, which he did do, which his guys did in July. They wanted me to come to Moscow in July, Moscow State University Physics Department, and give them my vision of what I'm telling you guys. So, so okay. Jack, so if Putin had it, we'll not go too okay, go ahead because that's that's some of the the more interesting stuff. Just to backtrack a little bit, yeah. you. Here, and and I think it's a wonderful opportunity to use your knowledge and understanding of these things to somewhat um, better help others understand some of these key figures in sort of UFO lore. Uh, people like Bob Lazar, Yuri Geller, um, Russell Targ. But just to start off with Bob Lazar, um, you know, Bob Lazar made a lot of incredible claims, right? Um, things like, you know, there's this name. Some true. Some of them are true. Do, do, do you want to sort of, are, yeah. do you want to say some of the things that you say as if are true and some of the things that aren't yeah yeah well I, the things I mean the things that I think are true I think he probably he was where he said he was he observed these things but he's not a high level physicist he doesn't really understand he's yeah he's he's like a like a community college level technician type guy he's smart he's smart. And he's articulate, and he's a, he's, a good, he's a good salesman. Not bad, but I, you know, he talks well, and so he's convincing. He can convince the idiots. He can say he's he's a very snake oil salesman, but he's good. And some of what he says is true. And he was, you know, so I think he was at Area Fifty One. I think he did see actual sources. They saw all that stuff. That's also consistent with what you know, John Warner, you know, the son of the former Secretary of the Navy and Senator John Warner, uh, who's related to Chris Mellon. Uh, Warner backs all this. And Warner says his father told him all this stuff, and his grandfather. They were all involved. The, you know, it all fits. Every, every the, the narrative is coherent because it fits what what uh, James Jesus Angleton's grandson told me. The same thing John Warner's telling me that his father. So I'm getting it from many different sources, independent sources, all basically telling me the same story. Okay, including people abroad. You know, in the foreign in foreign militaries so that I'm in touch with. All right. So, but but, but Jack, so just to just to say what a skeptic might say, because there's an argument to be made against that narrative, which is, you know, if there was this big group of individuals that were working in secret on what many would consider to be flying saucers, be it our own technology and physics that perhaps people like Bob Lazar at the community college level don't understand um, that others do. Um, is there an argument to be made that if there was this sort of alien intelligence here and they had crashed and people reverse engineering the technology? That there wouldn't be a plethora of other people that would have come out by now and said that they worked on these um, space. Well, that is happening. What, what, what do you mean? But that's exactly what's happening. What do you mean? That, that, that happens to be the fact. There are all, the point. Okay, I know. I work with a guy. I can't say who he is, obviously. Who has confirmed I, details? I know. And I know this guy is a real guy. He's not lying to me. I'd say that probably lying to me is like 1%. Yeah, it's always, yeah, but I don't think so. Yeah, I know him pretty well now. And he's, uh, and he knows stuff that more than what Grush knows. He knows it from first, because he was, you know, he's a guy who works on the machines, not, not a guy who heard it from somebody else. He's like, the horse's mouth, okay? But he right now uh, is afraid he'll be murdered or killed, like what Bruce said, if he if he goes public. And so just, okay. just ask a question on that. Who are the people yeah. who will murder or kill someone? Um, well, I don't know. Maybe, uh, may, may, who, um, may, well, maybe the people in the Pentagon that don't want it to have, uh, you know, according, according to RFK Jr., Right, the CIA murdered his, his, uh, the president of the United States and his father. Maybe not officially, but uh, then point things upon people accusing Alan Dulles. And by the way, I, I have a connection with Alan Dulles, but you know, but but it may not have been Dulles, but it may be some rogue element. Of, uh, you know, there there are bad people in these organizations. 
there are, and the ones who probably killed Kennedy are dead now themselves, right? Because they're too old. But there are, you know, there are factions. These organizations are not monolithic. I have friends in the CIA. I have enemies in the CIA and in, in the intelligence community in general. And there are people who probably want to kill me right now. Maybe they will, you know. So I and think if something happens, you know, if my plane crashes, you know, like the guy from uh, the Wagner thing, that could happen right now. This is serious business. I mean, I'm proposing technology that's going to totally revolutionize warfare. And well, I'm, is that the only thing I'm proposing? They're seeing it. That's what, that's what the whole, why are they having this congressional thing that they just had last week, was it, with David Grush, with uh, uh, Fravor, and with Ryan Graves, and there were supposed to be others who, who were afraid to appear, right? And, uh, and uh, so why were they doing that? Because the United States Navy cannot defend itself against incursions into its restricted airspace and its carrier battle groups, these billion, multi billion dollar, 10,000 men you know, battle groups. They're totally exposed. They're sitting ducks. They can't, they have no defense against this technology. The equations of which the Lawrence Livermore Nuclear Lab is now testing part of some of my equations, which is about this technology, right? Which is why the Russians invited me to Moscow last July. I didn't go, but they, they, they wanted me to go. Okay. So this is big, this is major. This is as big as Oppenheimer and the atomic bomb. In fact, it's bigger. What I'm so talking about is more important for the history of the world. Then the atomic bomb. Why? Because you cannot use the atomic bombs, right? You can't. You can't. You can't ex even explode. Putin's not going to explode a tactical nuke in in the battlefield of Ukraine. Because if he does that, it's going to escalate, and we're all going to be dead. We're all going to die of radiation. Yeah, it's going to be on the beach. So Putin knows that, and we all know that. Okay. But what I'm talking about is operational, because it's it's you know it doesn't involve killing the the planet. In fact, what I'm talking about is actually being shown, demonstrated in the skies now with the United States Navy. That's why the, they're having the, this, uh, the, these congressional investigations. So what I'm talking about is useful, it, you know, can be used. And in fact, what I'm talking about renders all current military weaponry impotent and obsolete, the way Reagan was talking about back in the 80s, okay? And the reason Reagan was talking about because he got that from me. Reagan actually got that from reports, of, literally from Jack Sarfati, working with the Reagan think tank in contemporary studies. So do you see the connect? This is all a coherent story I'm telling here. But Jack, you know, sort of. I dare anybody that anybody wants to, you know, you can have anybody come up and and I'll debate them on on the truth of what I'm talking about. I can prove everything. Yeah, so just I, I, I'm, I could go and I, I, I probably will. I can go before the Senate Intelligence Committee, the congressional committees, okay, and under penalty of perjury, tell my story. I'm not worried about, you know, uh, committing perjury. I'm, yeah, I'm telling the truth the best I can. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm sure and, and I'm positive of that, but I think it's worth explaining because there are points that skeptics might raise that. From the outside are seemingly logically coherent um things like you know if this big group of people and and you know these groups of people would include scientists like yourself brilliant minds who've been to cornell yeah. the best of the best theoretical physicists a smart mind yeah. might ask the question um i expect the best of the best to be working on the best of the best technology and so that's just somewhat of a rap point that someone might make um but they're not but the fact they're not, they haven't been because of the stigma thing and the security. There's, but go ahead, go ahead, finish. I don't. One of the things that you know people keep bringing up in, in relation to this, and Bob Lazar said this as well, and I, you've mentioned this in the past too, is that there's this over compartmentalization of things. And yeah, you, that's the big thing. That's the main thing. Yes. That's a very big, big factor in all of this. And so a skeptic yeah. tends to say, you know, if this thing existed, then why aren't people at the Institute for Advanced Physics at Princeton? the best of the best working on it. Um, what would your answer to that be? The answer is, well, first of all, I know a lot of the best. I mean, I knew John Wheeler pretty well, Kip Thorne. I know what their interests. I've been to study. I've been to Kip Thorne's house at least twice. 
So I mean, three times. When you they're one of the best. And the parties, and I know what they talk about. Now, Kip, though, you got to understand something. John Archibald Wheeler was like Edward Teller. He was the top guy with Teller in the whole atomic energy, setting up Lawrence Livermore, setting up Los Alamos. Everything that happened, you know, the Department of Energy. It's all Wheeler and his students. He had hundreds, and Kip Thorne, all his students. Okay. They run the show in terms of nuclear weapons, all that kind of stuff. So they have top security. Guard. And I know what they know. And they don't talk, you know, I can tell from what the papers they publish, unless they kept it very, very secret, which I doubt very much, okay? And also if they had this stuff already back years ago, they could have had it years ago. And actually they couldn't. The reason they couldn't have, okay. The, okay, I'll tell you the big reason why, why none of them have it. The reason they're keeping it secret is because they are out of fear, out of a justified fear, because they hadn't a clue as to how it worked. Up until recent, up until me, up until Sarfati, up until maybe 2010, they hadn't a clue how to work. And I know that for a fact because the guy, a guy I'm actually working with, the <laughs> guy I'm working with, oh, there it all. His job, his job. One of the guys I work with, I'm not going to say who, is not anybody or, or, or whose name is, is, is known around here. It's you know kind of secret. Uh, his job was to figure out the propulsion system of an intact saucer. Exactly what Cruz was talking about. That was his job for years. Failed. Failed. They all failed. They didn't know. They, they couldn't do it. They could, side time, they have these intact saucers, okay? Like, the, what are they saying? There were 12, but we have 12 or 13, and the other, Russia, they have there about 30 of them, okay, of different designs, but some of them are, they can't even, okay, the source is there. They have to get an intact thing. They can't even get inside it. They can't dent it. They can't do a fucking thing unless, unless the source itself is a conscious artificial intelligence. It's the same with that quality on, on, on the damn telephone in 1953. See, that's why I'm very confident about this now because I'm getting all this intel from different people telling me the same thing. From credible, credible people, you know, people connect with the military, so and the Jack, intelligence. Would you would would you agree with Lazar in the statement that these existed, these saucers have existed under the possession of perhaps the U.S. and other countries since the nineteen since nineteen forty five? Maybe before that. Well, the uh, Mussolini apparently, yeah. the Italians may have had one in nineteen thirty three. Yeah, I know. Apparently, Russians have have them. Too. So this is a global, this is a worldwide thing, which by the way, you know, even the Senate, even Gillibrand and Cortez, all those politicians, they're all saying that, that, that this is what I'm saying. So, you know, it's kind of the standard official narrative right now. What, uh, you know, uh, so, yeah. So, so what, say, so what are you asking me again? Yeah. So, you know, one of the other hard things to understand is why it is that this only seems to be a conversation happening in the U.S. right now? Why isn't this conversation happening in Russia? You know, the Russians did invite you uh, because they do yeah, take... well, it is happening in Russia, but they don't talk about it as public as we do. Yeah, they wanted me to come there. Yeah, if it wasn't they, for the war, I would have. Yeah, and you know, it's sort of hard to understand, at least for some people, how it is that... Um, you know, an individual like Bob Lazar would work on a project like this. And since his time, no other high level um, individual would come out and reveal some of these things. Well, no, but it has happened. It has been for, that's not true. I don't approve of Stephen Graham anyways, but he's had all these, it's been happening for 20, 30 years now. We had, what are you talking about? In, in 1999, 1998, we were given several million dollars by Joe Furmage, a whole bunch of us from NASA and stuff, to work on the UFOs. Yeah, we're involved with the, the with the CIA and President Clinton, the whole whole thing. So this has been going on for a long time. Uh, there were all kinds of press conferences. All, there were hundreds of military people coming out once saying that it's real. So what? So so that now I don't know who's saying that, but they just don't know what the facts are. That's simply false. Yes. Is that people have been whistleblowing for a long time. Yeah, so but, I'm, you know, I'm. But the, 
the media has suppressed it. That's what, you know, it's, it's uh, we don't have a free press. Everything with that, it, the Ukraine thing has proved that because, okay, we're being told that Ukraine's winning the war. In fact, Ukraine is finished. You read, the truth is Douglas, Colonel Douglas McGregor, West Point graduate, war, American war hero. He's not an agent of Vladimir Putin, you know. I don't want to get too much into that, but well, everything everything that the press is a propaganda. It's like uh, we are living in uh, George Orwell's, the combination of George Orwell's 1984 uh, and Brave, uh, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World and uh, 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 Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451 on steroids, especially now because of the Google and all that stuff. Okay, that's what we're living in. And we have a bunch of idiots and a bunch of slaves. Okay, well, most all all the progressives in the, in the liberal cities, the high density population, that it's like they're in prison. You know, and even well, yeah, you spend most of your time in the screen. You don't go out. You don't talk to people. You text everybody, and everybody's being isolated. And all of those, are, and that's the majority of people in New York, in Washington D.C., including the people in the government in San Francisco, right here in Los Angeles. And all those people who are totally alienated, uh, they're the ones who voted Biden in, because Biden's a senile idiot. And they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're like uh, marching morons. They believe the New York Times. They believe the Washington Poop, the Washington Post. They believe all this propaganda. And they don't know shit from which I know about what's really going on. And of course, it's very dangerous because people in the government don't know what's going on. So we're going to lose. I mean, you know. Yes. Yeah, so, 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 it's Jack, ridiculous. I, I'm, yeah. I'm in full agreement with you, but it's, you know, it's hard pressed for people who haven't understood this, the history of some, some of this stuff to just yeah. jump, especially starting 2017 and believing it as fact. Um, so, it's, you know, it, that's why it's somewhat interesting to, to poke at some of those things. You know, um, Elon Musk has come out and said, um, yeah. if those and aliens existed, they'd be the best source of funding for the DOD. Um, and he says he's seen no evidence whatsoever. And he, and he, claims- yeah, well, he hey, listen, Elon Musk, look, I love, I like, I love, many things I like about him. I like what he's doing. But Elon Musk is a schmuck, too. I was, I've been a schmuck. He's a, he, doesn't, he doesn't know everything, okay? He knows a lot of things. He's a genius in many things, but this he doesn't know. And he doesn't know the physics well enough. And he doesn't really have the facts, okay? And he's living in a little bubble. Eventually, Elon Musk is going banging on my door, wanting to get in because he's going to need the technology I'm talking about, especially if the Lawrence Livermore thing works. You know, that's it. It's a new world. And then, you know, okay. So the point is, what I'm talking about is controlling the gravitational field with small amounts of energy. That means Elon Musk's rockets, you just uh, junk a heap. Forget it. It's brilliant. nice engineers. But it's great, you know, but, it's, but, but who needs it? It's stupid. Yeah, I mean, just to stop you here, you know, yeah. get to Mars. You don't need it to get to Mars. These things get to Mars a lot quicker and safer. No, that's All true. Right? There's a question, you know, sort of that I've heard in the past in regards to yeah. the big divide between the things we know to be scientifically possible and our economic ability to produce those things at scale. And so it could be that yeah. we can build these things, right? And we have all the physics know-how and technology know-how now and the industrial base to do so. Um, but we simply, the unit economics simply doesn't make sense yet. Um, because what? the unit economics simply doesn't make sense yet to build these things. At scale. Um, because it'd be too Why? expensive to produce. So if we were to assume that, you know, we need to build multiple Tic Tacs or, or multiple UFOs, yeah. in sense, can yeah. we afford yeah. to do that right now? Well, I don't know right now. Because can we afford to make an F thirty five? This is simpler than F, simpler than, than the technology we have now. It's better. It's low energy. You don't need a lot of gasoline. You don't need jet engines. You don't need any of that stuff. It's all, you know, solid state condensed matter physics at low energy. I mean, this energy scale and this is room is one fortieth of an electron volt, a couple of electron volts. You don't need millions of electron volts. Yeah. So, so- it's no the tech. Is no different from what we're building or building a Tesla car. Yeah. So wouldn't I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't you think so that, that, that you know that makes no sense at all? Well, you say it's just not. Yeah, that's not. 
Yeah, that I mean, it's, it's, it's more expensive to build a rocket to build for Elon to build his his, his giant firecracker there that's going to blow up and kill everybody in it. And, and then even if they make it to Mars, they're going to kill each other by going stir crazy in that little tin can. And then when they get there, it's a very hostile environment. The whole thing is stupid. It's dumb. As smart as Elon is, he's stupid. So is Jeff Bezos. You know, it's it's I'm very much in agreement because too often you have people who are brilliant in one field, in one narrow field, yeah. assume they're brilliant at everything. And so it's yeah, it's, right. Yeah. And so and yeah, so and that's right by the way, that's exactly what happened to Joe Furmage, who you know gave us a couple of million bucks to uh, you know to work on. He thought because he he you know he lucked out. Uh, on the internet, U.S. web, something that he understood physics, and he totally screwed up. <laughs> By the way, that's happening in if, if you read, if you listen to Douglas McGregor, that's what these guys who are around uh, Biden in the Defense Department, you know, in the National Security Council, in the Pentagon, they, you know, they're like theorists. They don't know what the hell they're doing. They're totally screwing up. They've defeated. They've defeated us. Russia is one. <laughs> they, they, we put sanctions on on Russia. Their economy is doing better than Germany. Germany's collapsing. The, the Russians added, I don't know, how many millions. They have thousands of new millionaires since the war began in, in February you know, 2022. They've added millionaires. They're not doing badly. They're doing better than we are. They don't have inflation. So everything has, everything has screwed up. Everything we've done has been self-destructive. From day one, so well, you saw Biden going Kabul and now the same thing. We're gonna, it's a good, it's total defeat in Ukraine. And all these poor, you know, these these Ukrainian young men and the Russians too, all these hundreds of thousands of casualties for nothing. This is stupid. It was nothing. Not worth it. They've got, and if anything, Ukraine's destroyed. It's gonna be, you know, a little a rump state. Right. I think, yeah. Plus, so, there are Nazis. There are Nazis in Ukraine. Okay, I didn't mean to get into politics, but that, you know, oh, you know it's hard it, not to. Yeah, okay. no. Yeah, no, it's very important that you get into politics because, you know, too often politics, especially for scientists, is somewhat of a dirty subject. But politics becomes yeah. very necessary when you deal with real life um, decision making. Of course. What Oppenheim is about, my professors built the atomic bomb. So, of course, you know, right away, even in Cornell in the 50s, you know, it's only uh, 10 years since World War II, since the bomb. So everybody's political. All, all my professors were highly political. You know, with Teller and, and Oppenheimer, and the, yeah. you know, so, uh, so yes, I mean, my, my professors built the bomb. <laughs> you know? Just just to get back to sort of the Elon Musk question. Um, so yeah. what do you think that given Elon Musk having built Tesla and this large industrial base around EVs, wouldn't he be the yeah. perfect um, option for the U.S. government to approach and say, hey, we have these alien spacecraft or UFOs that we need reverse engineered and then built at scale, um, wouldn't he be the perfect person? Oh, yeah, Elon Musk. Elon, look, yeah, I agree. Elon, that's where he's... Elon Musk is going to build these Tic Tacs, probably. A guy like... It's probably going to be Elon Musk. They can build, build them in the Tesla factory and convert Teslas <laughs> into Tic Tacs. <laughs> in fact, wait, what are we talking about? Wait, are we talking about? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You know, you know I, was, I was the inspiration for Emmett Brown. Okay. Absolutely. The bus. We're gonna. Okay. The Tic Tacs. I mean, yeah, the Tesla. The Tesla is gonna be built with a metamaterial body, with a conscious. Like, I mean, he's already into this stuff, right? He's already into self-driving car. Not only is the Tesla gonna be self-driving, it's gonna be conscious. It's gonna argue with the driver. No, I want to go here. No, I want to go. There. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Seriously, that's coming. No, I'm in very. And it's not that. Far away. And not only that, wait, 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 wait. Not only that, the test is going to have anti gravity. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be exactly like out of, uh, you know, Back from the Future. The thing's going to, you can, it's going to, it's a flying car. Hey, hey, right, not only that. Wait a minute. You saw Iron Man, you know, movies. Iron Man. That's all. Oh, you, you got to Okay. Also, you have so. Okay. Well, first of all, warfare is all going to be robots, right? We're not going to, there's no point using humans. Just like right now, there's no point using uh, pilots like Com Commander Fravor, Ryan Graves. These are great guys, but they are finished. They're like, oh, okay. Pilots and jet planes, 
like the F-16, we're putting in these, these, these Ukrainians that can't hunt in there. They, they are like the knights on the mounted, you know, they're like they're like the the knights on the horses with the, the crossbow. Okay. That's so, so now with the drones, the artificial intelligence, we don't need living people. In fact, there's no need for uh, yeah, infantry a little bit, but it's all going to be done with uh, by machines. You know, it's kind of like, I mean, that's, that's, it's, we're almost there already. And now what I'm talking about, what I'm talking about, because remember, CIA asked me in 70, and said, could George Koopman, CIA and Department of Defense, Army Tank Command, you know, the, the, you know, the whole Pentagon thing, said, Jack, we want to know two things. How does consciousness work? So that's con that's artificial intelligence and, you know, conscious, you know, super artificial intelligence. How does that work? And how do the flying saucers work? I mean, how do you control gravity with small amounts of energy? We didn't formulate it that way. It took me a while because they didn't know. They're too stupid. They don't know. You know they're like Bob Lazar. So George Cooper didn't know anything more like he's like a Bob Lazar type guy, except with a lot of money. Came, came from a rich family. You know, he, oh, George Cooper in 1975 was like Christopher Mellon in 2023. George came from a rich, the, the Salzburger family, the the family, the rich Jews uh, from uh, from New England and New York, who ran the New York Times. That was his. He was from that family. He was a rich trust fund. He went, to, you know, and and he went into the intelligence services, sort of like Chris Mellon. You know, he was a Jewish version of Chris Mellon. Okay, <laughs> and into rockets, and, and actually, he was. I think he was murdered. He was actually murdered because he was uh, into. Yeah, he was. He was killed in a very strange fashion car accident on his way to Edwards Air Force Base where they're testing secret rocket stuff. Okay. And he was because he was, you know, he had been supporting funding me and so, but whatever. So that's a complicated story. But um yeah, yeah, Jack, I think you, yeah. one one of the other interesting things about this before we return to sort of your biography um is yeah. that you have this need to maintain an asymmetric advantage as a nation state, right? You always want to be one step ahead of your competitors. Um, and the CIA, well, America has failed to do it. We're, we're no longer, but go ahead. Yes. Yeah. So you, you want to maintain that asymmetric advantage and you always want to be yeah. one step ahead technologically and, and culturally as a whole. Um, so yeah. one might pose the question, why is it that we shouldn't believe that this is simply technology built with black budget funding in secret by the U S and not aliens? Because there's nobody in the black box projects who's as smart as I am about this stuff. No, I'd love to be proved wrong. I can maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, you know, Eric Davis says, Jack Safari has done in Kruger and that I think I'm smarter than I really am. And okay, maybe, maybe he's right. So we'll see. But I claim, I claim the reason it hasn't been done is because they couldn't do it because they don't know what I already know. They still don't understand most of them what I'm trying to communicate. The guys at Lawrence Livermore do understand it. You know, in fact, they 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 are <laughs> building a big machine and they're doing numbers. They understand. So, so this guy named Michael G. Anderson, who's the project leader of the Warp Fusion Reactor Project at Lawrence Livermore Nuclear Weapons Laboratory. <clears throat> I, I posted a paper on academia like three years ago, and they've been working in secret on this. They only revealed it in, on June 10th on Tim Venter's APEC, uh, you know, video cast. And they don't know, and there's, there's, a, there's a Sarfati equation. They didn't tell me about it, okay? Now they want, they asked me if I want to sign an NDA and help on the project, but you know, I'm not doing that for other reasons. I don't want to be, you know, I, I, let, I, I encourage them. I, help, I wish them all the success and I will help them any way I can, but I don't want to be under any kind of restrictions by the federal government as to what I can communicate at this point, I'm still a free agent. Okay. No, that's so there we are. So the point is, so the point is no, okay. The reason they couldn't have done this, see, there's this all these guys, they you know, everybody there, even the physicists, you have to take relativity courses. Okay. I'm, you have to take a course in Einstein's theory of relativity. But there are two theories. There's what's called the special theory, which is kind of nuclear physics, the bomb and all that stuff. The special relativity. And there's also general relativity, which is gravity. 
Now, up until very recently, general relativity was never really taught in most physics departments. It's just what I was taught, only a few. And even when it is taught, it's mainly taught as a mathematical subject. The physics, the physical meaning of these complex equations are not really taught because the people who teach general relativity are generally mathematically, they're basically, basically mathematicians, they're not even physicists because there's a lot of mathematics involved, okay? And they don't even know the physical meaning. They don't. Now that said, the, the big exception to that was Kip Thorne's group at, you know, at Caltech from Wheeler. I mean, because Wheeler's engineer, Wheeler, oh, they, they understand that they're building all these gravity interferometers. They're the only ones who really understand it. And of course, they were influential. The Kip Thorne's students, they run the Department of Energy. They run all the black projects. Okay? They run all that stuff. Right. And, um, and of course, the Russians, and actually, it turns out the collaboration kept on with the Russians very close, Igor Novikov. This thing with the black, uh, the, the revolution in general relativity has been a joint US Russian project from back even during the Cold War, they were cooperating. They're going back and forth, even with the Soviet Union. Okay, so it's a very, it's really a, a US Russian collaboration to some extent, the Germans and, and the British, you know. So, um, so, but the, here's the thing. When they're taught relativity, right, you hear nothing can go faster than the speed of light, right? Nothing can go faster than the speed of light. Speed of light's an absolute constant. You can't do anything about it. Speed of light is what it is in vacuum. In vacuum, okay. And then they, and, and they just parrot that without actually thinking really what it means operation. Then when they get the general relativity of gravity, they sort of say the same thing. They don't think, they don't really understand there are subtle differences between the way the speed of light in vacuum works in flat, in special relativity and in general relativity. It's a little different. And they don't, under, the, the, the difference eludes them. And that's, so in particular, in particular, in Einstein's general theory of relativity, he has what's called a field equation where a certain amount of concentration with energy density Stress energy is called a certain. You have to have a certain amount of energy in a given volume of space, okay? And as you as you pr push more and more energy, total energy, into a smaller and smaller volume of space, what happens is it it bends gravity. It creates a you know a gravitational field stronger and stronger, okay? But now there's a coupling constant. And the coupling constant involves the speed of light to the fourth power in the denominator. It's a fraction. The numerator is what's called Newton's gravitational constant, what Newton discovered back in the 17th century. But it's divided by the fourth power the, of the vacuum speed of light in vacuum, okay, to the fourth power. And because the speed of light is so big, the speed of light in vacuum is you know 300 million meters per second or 186,000 miles per second, okay? And because, because in, the, in the same units, uh, Newton's big G is, is pretty small. I think it's like 10 to the minus 11 or something like that. 10 to the minus 11. So, and so, so you have like 10 to the four. I, this thing is so weak. Okay, that 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 the belief is that that's why you can never have a warp drive. See, everybody knows warp driving principles possible. All physicists, you know, who I mean, who are not stupid, you know, not, <laughs> they know in principle you can have warp drive, but yeah, but we can't do it because it takes two or more energy than the entire universe to, to try to make a, a warp drive starship like in Star Trek. Can't do it. See, right? No. Huh. So then it turns out, but all the um, all the experiments of general relativity are basically done in vacuum. Okay, but the question is, what happens inside matter? And and uh, you know, when you combine what a, what are Einstein's field equations look inside matter, like these new metamaterials, very you know, anisotropic, they're, they're artificial materials. It depends; they're directional dependent. They're not the same. They're inhomogeneous. 
they look different in different directions inside. If you're, you know, if you're inside being anisotropic, inhomogeneous, and they're also uh, they don't they change in time. They're dynamic space time. They call space time metamaterials. Has to do uh, an example. Uh, Frank Wilczek, Wilczek from MIT, who won the Nobel Prize in 2004. He has now what called time crystals. The time crystals is a special case of what I'm talking about. It's a special case of the space time metamaterial includes. Will, will check time crystals. And it has all kinds of new counterintuitive properties, new stuff, new phenomena emerge in these things, especially when you pump them like a laser. They're, they're, they're kind of like a laser. You pump it into a coherent state, sort of like a laser, except that except the, the coherence of, is of these emergent quasi-particles inside the material. They can't exist in vacuum, okay? So the point is then, so the whole idea, which I had finally in, in 2010, when I was invited to the DARPA NASA uh, meeting of the 100 Starship, the yeah, Star Trek Project in Orlando in October of 2010, 2011, I guess it was 2011, I finally put two and two together. And I said, hey, these metamaterials, if we pump them right, what, what effectively what they do, and I, I'm being a little sorry, they make the speed of light down to zero, close to zero, inside the, the material. So it's geo. So, so since the speed of light is in the denominator, going uh, to the fourth power, and if you make it go from three hundred thousand, I was from three hundred uh, ten to the eight, three hundred million meters per second in vacuum. If you make it go one tenth of a meter a second, so to speak inside the metamaterial, okay? So that's like uh, 10 to the ninth. That's, that's uh, to the fourth power. What's, what's four times What's four times nine? 36. So you've, you've, you've increased the, the strength of the coupling by 36 powers of 10. 10 to 36. Okay, oh, okay. So at, 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 uh, <laughs> at Livermore now, this is not just theory anymore. At Livermore, they've taken this idea of mine and in their fusion reactor, what they have is a hot, uh, uh, heavy ion plasma, and they they and they you know they smash two opposing beams in a little volume of about one ten millionth of a cubic meter. Okay, this plasma compressed plasma. I think it's maybe compressed with lasers. I'm not sure. There's an idea that I had many years ago. Okay, and they claim that you know the, that, that number, that C number to the fourth power, they're going to get 10 to the 32. I'm talking about 10 to 36. They get an amplification of the coupling of 32 powers of 10 in this little plasma. That, that's, that's what they're, they're published in this stuff. You know, if my stuff is right, they get a, an amplification of 32 powers of 10, which means in this little volume of a tenth of a millionth of a cubic meter, they're going to generate a gravity field that's 16,000 times the Earth's gravity field at, at the surface. In other words, you would weigh 16,000 times more if you're a little guy in a bubble on the surface bubble. 16,000 times, 16,000 G, okay? And what's called the, the curvature is 22 powers of 10 bigger than the curvature at the surface of the Earth, which is very weak, by the way, but, but it's still, you know, so these fantastic numbers, and still, by the way, it's not a black hole. I did the people of the mother can make a black hole, it'd be dangerous. No, it, I did. You still have many powers of 10 saved. It's not a black hole. It sounds like it might. I thought maybe it was until I, I plugged in the numbers and everything. Yeah, it's not, and even if it was a black hole, it, it would probably evaporate very quickly anyway. So you wouldn't even know. So sure. so the point is now this is a real thing they're gonna. They haven't done it yet. I think they just proposed because they have to get the money to do it. This is they want to do this experiment to test. This is just test a part of my equations that explain the tic tacs. Yeah. That so, explain how to control. The okay. So Jack, we, we don't want to go too deep into the equations because it's best yeah. to show people the formulation for that um, when yeah. we. So it doesn't seem too ambiguous in some sense, but you know, yeah. some question sort of the way in which you're saying this by saying. What makes you feel as if you have the right UFO equations or let's say um, metamaterial uh, uh, equations? What makes you feel as if that's the right approach? 
have you worked on this craft yourself personally or what, well, what because why is it the right approach yeah what's giving you this intuition well, because number one, I learned my physics, you know, how to think about physics. You know, there's a, see, there's a thing. This is why it's important who your professors were. You know, there was this old apprentice, it's like the guild thing goes way back, right? But, you know, the young men in the tribes, the shamans, right? It's all right. Well, okay. So who are the modern day shamans? So my, my main, who... Who do I get a sense of how to do physics? You, you know, it's more than just one sitting in the class and just taking notes. It's it's like being with these minds and kind of it's an intuitive. It's always a it's a paranormal psychological thing. Your minds get entangled, right? Right. So who who do when, I, when I'm 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, Who am I observing, so to speak? Hans Hans Beta. See the film Oppenheim, right? Hans Beta, chief of theoretical physics division, Manhattan Project. Like the, you know, the most probably second in command at the Manhattan Project is my, you know, in his office, alone with him. You know, he's showing me things. I'm saying his mind is thinking. Eric Davis doesn't have that. These guys, they, they were the second, you know, I mean, how much I, they don't, I'm, and, 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 uh, Hans Bethe, his professor was Arnold Sommerfeld, you know, before around World War One time. Ahmed in Munich, you know, one of the good giant, uh, you know, like with Einstein. Okay, Arnold Sommerfeld, his lecture is very clear. Bethe was known to be how clear he was. He would lecture. It was like, oh my God, you know, people are just like, <laughs> you know, he was so clear, he was so brilliant. Okay, and uh, so and Phil Morrison, the Renaissance man. And so I get a sense this, and also they were saying, see, the big the Cornell thing. These are the guys who built the bomb, so they proved they could. Robert Wilson, I was like, yeah, Bill, you know, Kenneth Grice and all these guys. Well, you know, who were for four years, I was hanging out with them. I was their their, their students, okay. Uh, and and the whole thing with Cornell said, you know, they were echoing Einstein, saying, as simple as possible, but not simpler than is possible. As little mathematics, more physics, less math. So now you see a guy like Eric Weinstein, just the opposite. You go with most of these papers, most of these guys, they're doing all this excess 20, 20 zillion dimensions and this is six, six, seven, seven times, all this stuff. That, and as, as Einstein said, they're intelligent fools. He says, an intelligent fool makes something more complicated than it has to be. Whereas it takes a little stroke of genius to go in the opposite direction, apparently that's nice. And that was what was instilled in me as an undergraduate at Cornell with these guys who were giants in the field. And then I was also later hanging out with Richard Feynman and John Wheeler, and David Bohm and Roger Penrose and you know, uh, uh, Keith Faulkner, Abdus Salam. These are giant names, and, you know, oh, um, uh, the others, Valentin Bargman, uh, some extent, Eugene Vigda, you know, listening to him talk. Uh, so these are these are giant. These are the guys who built physics. Yeah. So Jack, you. So I guess that that's a really good response to this. Something that I know, but it's worth the listener understanding very well. Um, yeah. It, no. Let me say something else. Let me say something else. And it turns out, if you're not an idiot, <laughs> you know, if you just see, even the good physicists. They won't look at it. You know, they're afraid. That, oh, it doesn't look. You know, they're afraid they're gonna lose their money. So they don't even look at the problem. They don't even get the facts. They don't even know. They also, that's just crazy. This is you know, nuts. You know, this is you know, this is stupid. Okay. So, so they're not gonna see it. Okay. But it turns out if you take, like, uh, what the one good thing Louis Elizondo, the, the five observables, you know, the instant acceleration, the apparent high g force, stuff like that. All these things, and if you. If you just look, and then you just look at Einstein's equation, and you see, you, it's it's obvious what's going on, that there's a technology that effectively increases the strength of the coupling between what's called the stress energy tensor and the induced gravitational field. And physics is an empirical thing. So what we're seeing, these things flying around, you take that, that, that evidence uh, as factual, as true, which I do, 
you know, for, even for the sake of argument, even if it's hypothetical, but let's suppose it's true, then how do you explain it, okay? Like a lawyer, you know, whatever. That's what a theoretical physicist does. You know, this, I have to believe it, but I do believe it, but the point is I could be wrong about it. But let's suppose it's true. How do we explain it? Then it's perfectly obvious how that coupling constant can be controlled, can be increased. But then what happens, these idiots, my colleagues, you know, and I just call them schmucks because yeah, I've been a schmuck myself. Yeah, we're all schmuck. Original schmuckiness is original sin, original schmuckiness. Now, but they, they, oh, well, the speed of light is a universal constant. Can't change it. Can't change it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, like, a, you know, it's like, you know, it's like you know, the Virgin Mary one was not a virgin. Christ is not, you know, uh, Christ is not God. It's like that. They're, in the, they're running around. They're, they're, like, they're like the priests in the temple. They really are. I mean, psychologically, they're no different. They think yeah. they're scientists, but no, they believe certain things. Well, speed of light is constant. Can't change that. So that's why they haven't seen it. And so, that's why they haven't done anything. Because all these guys in the government, they think like that. Because they just think, they just repeat like parrots what they were taught as students by professors who also didn't understand it deeply. And they just learned all this, you know, like a, they have a very superficial understanding of what the uh, constant, but what the, uh, they, they confuse what, what's called, they don't understand the speed of light in vacuum. Number one, it is homogeneous. That is the speed of light is the same no matter where you go in the universe. People think that, okay, and that's okay. But they confuse that with what is, what's called the invariance. See, the invariance of the speed of light is not the same as what's of the homogeneity of the speed of light. I'm so, just talking vacuum right now. In other words, if Alice and Bob are moving relative to each other. And they have to be what are called inertial observers. They cannot be accelerating. They're just moving uniformly relative to each other. And if they each measure the vacuum speed of light, they're going to get the same number, even though they're in relative motion. That's special relativity. That's called invariance. But it's only a special kind of invariance. It's called inertial frame invariance. Turns out when you get to accelerating frames, then things get a lot more complicated. But they, most of these guys, they don't even understand that much. So, they don't understand that much. So this is probably a good so, so, so the, chime in on the idea that, um, and this is something that probably irritates you as it does me, which is this idea yeah. we're observing with these Tic Tacs is beyond or it breaks the laws of physics, which I just find Yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, I, my blood pressure. I have to take a pill. Pardon me. I got to take my blood pressure pill. <laughs> okay. Because it's so stupid. It gets me out. Okay. So, so that. Okay. Actually, but, whoa. Go ahead. So that's somewhat. Yeah. So if there's something yeah, that you don't understand that seems to break the laws of physics, to me, it just suggests yeah. what I've always suggested, which is that there are laws of physics we either don't understand or haven't understood fully, right? No. Okay. Now, wait a minute. It's that whoever says that, they don't understand the laws of physics. And that too. They don't understand it because they're stupid when it comes to physics. They may be smart in other ways, but they're dumb. And they're arrogant and they don't understand that they're stupid, that they don't understand the limits, what they don't understand. See, so what was it? You know, there's things that you know, things that you think you they should. Yeah, you know, all that stuff that, what was his name? You know, the guy actually used to work for him a little bit, uh, died from a second, Don Worm, Don. Don Rumsfeld. The thing is, okay, so now, so the thing is this, Einstein's general relativity explains all that stuff. You don't need new laws of physics. And that's why I got into an argument with Louis Elizondo and Chris Mellon. They're saying, oh, you know, it takes all this stuff we don't understand. They're so stupid. They don't, have, they never took a physics course, really. And they, they doubt, you know, I'm trying to tell them, hey, it, it, we understand it. And they say, oh, no, no. No, no, you can't understand. I mean, again, so that, that's what this whole thing would. And I don't know why they're saying that. There, there, there may be reasons. I don't, who knows why? Because of money. Uh, Ron Pedolfi, the CIA guy, says they're, they're crooks. They're into they're trying to get money. Who the hell knows? I don't know what the truth is. So, so, so but, Jack, uh, what, one of the things that comes up in regards to that and why they might say that, yeah. and one of the ideas is proposed is within the intelligence community, you have this idea of strategic ambiguity where you sort of the waters with information that is decoherent to some extent um and so some of the ideas in regards to these tic tacs are you know perhaps the u.s does have technology next generation drones that operate on some version of metamaterial gravitational propulsion but this is sort of 
a um, a note or a notice to sort of Russia and China letting them know, hey, we have this classified technology that goes above and beyond what you can ever imagine. It's alien-like, so-called alien-like. Um, and that's somewhat of the reason why some of this is so vague and decoherent. Do you think that makes sense? Okay, well, if, yeah, if that was, you know, assuming that was that scenario, then they told that our guys totally botched it because that's not the impression that the Russians and Chinese are getting, is it? <laughs> not at all. <laughs> of course, you may be right because look how they botched Ukraine, look how they botched Kabul, everything they're doing on the open borders, everything they're doing is destroying the United States and weakening. Okay, so what's the situation now? We're running out of ammunition. We have all these thousands of terrorists now have come through ready to sleep as cells, probably ready to, you know, take out our infrastructure. You know, we're, we're totally, the United States is totally defenseless against domestic, not, I don't know, terrorists, you know, against enemy military units now embedded inside the United States through the, the borders. And we have no, I mean, and, and they, the, uh, the American military cannot recruit. Any any real man is not going to join. Them. What the hell want to join and, and and have to get dressed up in a dress with uh, you know, all this transgender bullshit? I mean, it's just crazy. And of course, hey, if I were if I were uh, Putin, right? If I were the the Russian intelligence services, I would encourage all this stuff in the United States. All this bull bull nonsense. Progressive, what is it? I would encourage that because it means the American army can't fight anymore. Combat effectiveness is that in the toilet. Not only that, we've given, we've, we've, we've used all our ammunition in, in Ukraine now, and we, we de industrialized all our stuff is manufactured in China, who's our kind of an enemy. So we can't even, it's not like World War II anymore. We can't, in, you know, in six months build you know, a thousand airplanes a month or all these tanks and then we came to make ammunition. We can buy ammunition. By the way, even private people, a friend of mine who's, uh, you know, has a permit to, to carry, you know, a uh, concealed and he's not able to get bullets for his gun. <laughs> okay. In California, you can't get it. So we're defenseless. I mean, you know, if uh, we're, we're in a very dangerous situation since, yeah. since Biden's ago. So is, you know, is it your opinion that this is less strategic ambiguity and more incompetence? Total incompetence. <laughs> Everything I've seen, people I know, the people I've been like, even even people who mean well, even people like like Chris Mellon and Louis Elizondo, they mean you know real many things, but they're totally incompetent. I mean, they're clueless because they don't understand basic things about physics. They don't understand things that I take for granted. They don't understand it. Okay. And consequently, because they don't understand it, they're screwing things up. They're making things worse, not better. So, so Jack, just to, to backtrack a little bit somewhat into the narrative yeah. um, and sort of the broader conversation. Yeah. If UFOs, you know, constantly you hear UFOs come up and, and I kind of hate the word UFOs, but we'll, 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 we'll resort to it because it's the best way for other people to understand. So oh, yeah, I, I, I like flying saucers, flying discs or Tic Tacs. Yeah. yeah. So, so UAP. UAP, yeah. um, so, you know, this conversation of UFOs seems to come up in regards to aliens a lot, right? You hear them as tangential yeah. conversations somewhat. Yeah. Why is it that we don't speak as seriously? So we have people like you who I, I don't think many people know about yet that are talking about, you know, UFOs and very serious, you know, very serious and engineer engineering capable ma ways. But we don't hear people talking about aliens as tangibly as as people talking about UFOs. Why do you think that is? Well, I, uh, <clears throat> it's a good question. The <laughs> reason is that it's going to because it's it's it scares people, and actually it should it should scare people. I was just um, uh, because some of these aliens are uh, are um, are not friendly, and they do have these telepathic powers the abductions are real and um, and this is this scare in fact this is a big thing in, in the intelligence community there's a whole faction 
who think that these aliens are uh, demons. You know, so they're, 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 you know, they're like uh, fundamentalist Christians and they actually have a point. They actually, okay, they are, the, okay. You know, that thing that James, the movie James Fox made just recently about Brazil, was it Brazil? Okay, so the two aliens there, they smelled, they had sulfuric smell. They smelled bad, like sulfur, and they had cloven hoof, cloven feet, exactly the, like the medieval depictions of the of demons, the devil. So some of these aliens, see, in other words, all the myths, angels and demons, in fact, that's a big thing, Jacques Vallée, allegedly, Jacques Vallée, you know, he lives near him. He doesn't live far from me. And apparently he has a, his whole library is full of religious books about angels and demons. Belle, Jacques Vallée, right? So this whole UFO. So the point is, all the stories in the, uh, you know, all the, the occult, all the angels and demons, they're real. They're just ETs. They're fairies. You know, they're leprechauns. It's a bit, uh, oh, with CRISPR technology, genetic engineering, we can make any kind of organism we want, then, right? They're now talking about it. In fact, uh, uh, what's his name? Martin Rees, the astronomer royal. I know him from a long time ago, who was the, um, uh, the head of uh, you know, Hawking's boss at the Institute for Theoretical Astronomy Cambridge, just on, on uh, just a few weeks ago on uh, uh, Tim Venturi's uh, uh, channel. I've been on that too. And he's talking about, uh, Martin mentions that they now figured out that uh, instead of four base pairs in the in the genetic code, be much more efficient and a much better organism, much more hardy, robust. So if you had eight base pairs, you know, in principle, so you could model this on computers, right? That's right. That would be genetic. You know, everything we know, uh, and then Martin said that one of his friends at Trinity College, where by the way I've stayed at Trinity College, came a couple of times. You know, in, Right, the you know, Martin lived, and um, and he said one of the one of the fellows at Trinity is now actually making artificial organisms with six base pairs. You know, you want to get up to eight, right? So these aliens and these and, and then there's this guy Michael Masters, uh, who has written a book. Uh, he's an anthropologist. I think he's in Wyoming, someplace like it. Yeah, you know, he's a, he, he's not a physicist, but he's come to the same conclusion. He says. These UFOs, they're from the future. And these aliens that I described are exactly what we expect from future evolution of humans, especially with genetic engineering, where we create our own organisms. So for example, uh, you know, the, the leprechauns, the little fairies, we can make those. We can make we can make we can make uh, we can make Bugs Bunny, we can make Mickey Mouse for real. Everything we can, everything that we fantasize, everything Walt Disney talked about in these other cartoons, you can actually make or you can make, or yeah, you can make animals like that. Just design the genetic code. I mean, you know, if we can't do it now, we'll be able to do it in twenty years, ten years, especially with quantum computers. So, yeah. So you know, but there are, in some sense, deep ontological questions that arise um, when we start discussing aliens, right? especially if these are aliens that are in some sense humanoid, if they have cultures of their own, if they enjoy music, yeah. if they have politics, um, there are, there needs to be some sort of tangibility to these aliens past just... Well, listen, all it means is that there's no more science fiction. Everything you read in science fiction is real. And the whole reason now, just think for a minute, Jules Verne, H.G. Wells, you know, and some of the others that seen these guys writing a hundred years ago, they're, you know, what Russ talked, precognitive remote viewing, they're actually seeing the future. You see? Oh, by the way, you know, there's a, you know, uh, Donald Trump's son is Baron Trump. You know, his son is his youngest son. Some guy a hundred years ago, and you can get it on Amazon, 1896, so, in 1900, you know, that back has written a couple of science fiction about Baron. The, the, the character is Baron Trump, named Baron Trump. Same name <coughs> as, <coughs> as Trump's son. And his time machine, and he travels through time. It's a science fiction thing. Written around the time of, of uh, 
Jules Verne. So how do you account for that? It's just a coincidence. <clears throat> that that's an interesting point. Do you do you feel as if um do you do you think it's a possibility that these UFOs <coughs> were given to us? Because it, it keeps, you know, people keep thinking that these things somewhat traveled from distant planets and seem to have crashed despite being a very advanced technology coming from a very advanced technological civilization. Do you think that there's some form of a prime directive, um, a federation of sorts, um, a group? Yeah, there may be. There may well be because, um, what do you call it? Um, Gene Roddenberry. Gene Roddenberry was part of the same group of people I was part of, with this Andrea Baharaj, Uri Geller, all this intelligence stuff. Gene Roddenberry was part of an occult study group, the Seth Papers, or the, the Nine, and all this stuff that you have to go into this. There are all these connections. And he was getting trans material, you know. In other words, Gene Roddenberry doing Star Trek as fiction is just a way of softening up the public for what's really true out there. See, Gene Roddenberry, Gene Roddenberry was exposed to intelligence information that this stuff is real. Same, the same kind of for the same people that I that have influenced me. Roddenberry, I never met Roddenberry, but we were involved with, you know one step removed from each other in terms of uh, people we talked to. And uh, that's also, I, I was told that uh, by this guy, Brendan O'Regan, who ran the CIA, probably was the second in command uh, for Edgar Mitchell, was running the SRI paranormal you know, the project at Stanford Research Institute. This guy, Olaf Stapleton, who wrote Star Maker, you know, I spoke back in the 1930s, that Stapleton was a British intelligence agent who was then channeling real information from the ETs. And that's what these books he wrote started. He wrote a couple of books, The Last Men in London, stuff like that, that this is based on fact, but presented as fiction. And there's even, there's a book called uh, Hollywood and the UFOs, which talks about, and this is true, I know, because I've been involved with it, but that, how Francis Ford Coppola, who I used to hang out with, Francis Ford Coppola and Steven Spielberg were still, you know, and all these guys, the guy who did Back to the Future. Uh, you know, these guys are all being given information by the Central Intelligence Agency, intelligence agencies, you know, to make these fictional things as so that when the disclosure really comes, that turns out, yeah, everybody takes it for granted now. I mean, you know, see, here's the point. The point is that physics is universal. The equations of Newton, Maxwell, uh, you know, thermodynamics. Uh, Einstein, relativity, quantum mechanics. Uh, these are universal things that struck the entire universe. And that means that any civilization, anywhere, the many habitable planets, we now know that, the exoplanets, you know, some, there's more than just Earth, right, in the whole universe. And uh, in fact, the millions, probably jillions, a large number. And any civilization that reaches a certain level is going to discover the, these equations that I discovered because they're elementary. They're not hard. If you, as soon as you know Maxwell's equations, as soon as you know special relativity and Einstein's equation uh, and some quantum mechanics, you, you know, this, this happens. You get warp drive. You get time travel. It's time travel. You control gravity. You control time. You can travel through time back anywhere, any when you want to go, anywhere when you want to go. So that's what the... Plus, you have these... Uh, Wormholes and stargates, they're real. So, uh, you know, the Greek gods, you go back into history, the Greek gods, the Hindu gods, the Egyptian gods, these are all, these are all ETs, they're all aliens, they're, they're time from the future, and they're coming back. They can come back, you know, like in the Stargate conspiracy, in the science, you know, it, may ha it can happen. We can all be enslaved. I mean, it could be just what all these movies about, you know, you know, invasion, you know, is a reality. That's why they're scared in the Pentagon. They know this. And I've yeah. been told, by the way, I've been told, I've been told that, the, that a lot of people are very frightened by this stuff. And they have reason to be. Uh, I, I, I understand it. They're yeah. not stupid about being frightened. You, be, you better be frightened in a way. But you have to understand it too. You have to you have to be able to count. You cannot defend it if you don't understand the physics. Then that's why what I'm saying is so. That's why what what, what Chris Mellon is doing is so dangerous and Elizondo because they're, they're they're sort of trying to oppose 
what I'm trying to say to people, what I'm saying to you, that they're opposing it, even though we agree on the fundamentals. So, yeah, you know, one, go one, ahead. I'm, yeah, you, you know, it's, it's it's sort of unusual for for some of the people that are both physicists, you know, mathematical physicists of sort, but are also interested in sort of aliens and, like I said, the ontological implications of them actually existing, yeah. in real world, to to find some correlation between UFOs and aliens, because those two subjects, I'm not sure if it's because. They both seem to exist in the realm of conspiracy. So conspiratorial people tend to talk about them tangentially or if if they're actually very related things. Um, well, how can they not be related? Of course they're related. I, mean, yeah, I, I don't even see, I don't understand the mindset of what you just told me. It just makes no, no sense to me whatsoever. But also conspiracy. Why did even that guy Vivek, the guy who's running for president? Yeah. The, the Indian, okay. He said... Uh, he made a good statement. He said that the time lag between a conspiracy theory and reality is about three weeks. Did he say that? I, I apparently said that the debate. Now, and then somebody on the internet said that no, it's like three days, getting down to three days. The point is that there's those that almost all conspiracy theories are true. Now, there are some which are not. I mean, people who say we didn't go to the moon, that the earth is flat. The Earth is hollow, you know all that. You know that those are you know the obvious idiot stuff. But when you have, when you have RFK Jr., who's a very smart guy, as far as I, you know, he may be off and certain. You know, I, you know, I I cannot second guess him on what he says about the vaccine and stuff like that because I don't really, you know, I, I know what I don't know and I stay away from it. I, I, I I'm an idiot when it comes to medical medical or biology. I don't know. So. Uh, but, uh, you know, he says that his father and uncle were killed by the CIA. You know, so it's, I mean, it's conspiracy. Oh, the election. Okay, right now, if you think that the, if you say that the 2020 election was not rigged, that it wasn't honest, then that makes you a domestic terrorist. Well, that's, you know, that's totalitarian. That's tyranny. Okay. And for the record, I think it was stolen. I mean, I have reasons, a lot of reasons. You know, so I agree with, with, with the president. 40 with 45 on that and and nobody's going to tell me otherwise because i know you know you have to be stupid not to realize it was rigged and then they're going to try to rig it again because they're going to put in a phony common thing and lock down as soon as you have mail-in ballots that's the election you can't trust the election and france found that out that's why france now i think they only have you have to vote on election day in person paper ballots no mail-in ballots Okay, because so that, that some some somebody was saying in Las Vegas during the 2020 election, they were in the hotels and you know the Vegas hotels and the ballots. There was just empty ballots, blank ballots, all lying on the floor. Anybody could pick it up and write it in. in it. So come on, I mean, yeah. So you know so, that's a valid yeah. point. I think it's so sad. It's actually very very sad that we've stigmatized the word conspiracy theory so much so yeah. that you speak rationally about real conspiracies. Um, okay. Anybody, yeah, exactly. Anybody who says that's a conspiracy theory, that person is trying to control your mind, and that person is the criminal. When they say, you know, they say, don't think it's a conspiracy theory. First of all, that person's even stupid, just you know, just an asshole, an idiot, who's just mouthing things without thinking, who's in love, you know, or, or is it really an enemy of the people? As far as I'm concerned, you would say that, that he's the domestic. What if he says? The, they're the best of terrorists. They're the ones who are who are, who are, who are uh, uh, ruining the country, not the people who, who who think about it. And you know, some some conspiracy theories are obviously stupid. So you just argue, say, "Hey, listen, this is stupid. Hollow Earth, flat Earth, you know, yeah, you know, so so it's stupid. But you're free to believe it. You want to be an idiot? Go ahead. So that's freedom. Yeah, you know, freedom of thought. <laughs> yeah. That's real democracy. That's very well said. Yeah, that is real democracy. And um... You know, it's it's best to be open minded at first, but uh, but but critical when you receive information. And yes, I... yeah, open minded but critical. It's a balance. Yeah, you, know, you have to say you have to continually. Exactly. Yeah. You don't want to be so critical that you get trapped in dogma. Um, so I I agree with you on that. But you know something else yeah. is so sad that has been trapped behind the veil of conspiracy to some extent is and and i'm not sure if you want to opine on this or if you have anything to say about this but i think your thoughts would be interesting is jeffrey epstein and sort of the political economy 
surrounding science, right? The ways in which science is funded. Um, so you hear Jeffrey Epstein, and it's always tangential to this, you know, somewhat disgusting and horrible pedophilic thing that he did, which I think anyone can agree yeah. horrible. But, you know, Jeffrey yeah. Epstein, a number of other things as well, like funding and being around extremely brilliant scientists at the world's leading. Yes, and Kip Thorne and Seth Lloyd. Yes. So he, so he was around a lot of the most brilliant scientists and and he was funding yeah. and those institutions. But that that part yeah. of the narrative the seems Cavley to- in Santa Barbara. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know a lot of these guys. Yes. I'm yes. glad he didn't invite me. I'm glad I wasn't there. <laughs> yes, that that narrative, that part of his story seems to get drowned uh behind yeah. all the conspiracy theorizing. And yeah. so it would be wonderful to get your opinion on what you think of sick people um that sometimes get involved in science um and him in specific well epstein yeah okay epstein uh it looks like he was uh, probably uh he was probably a Mossad agent that's what they say i don't know <clears throat> well he was aged for somebody maybe the russians who knows uh i don't know if it was Mossad. could be a uh, joint program Oh, who knows? That he was filming, you know, that it was a, you know, that's a honeypot situation to get to control them. So that's quite possible. And, and there's no question in my mind. I mean, Trump didn't want to come out with Tucker Carlson and ask him the, about Epstein. Uh, it's obvious that Epstein was murdered. He didn't kill himself. I don't think he killed himself. You know. So he was murdered because he knew too much. So, uh, and you know, there's a bunch of people that you know, a bunch of Russian oligarchs. You know, the, the what's almost all the physics that cut. It's uh, uh, what's the one in Canada, the, the, um, the Perimeter Institute. It's financed by a rich Russian uh, guy, and a bunch of them here. You know, uh, and there's nothing really wrong with it. Yeah, so, that, that, that's very true. But do you think that it's somewhat a failure on? organizations like the NSF um, and their ability to fund blue sky research that has caused people okay, like- listen, the government uh, got to understand the government, the federal government in particular, all governments are basically incompetent. The lowest of the low go into government. I mean, they're not, the, you know, the low IQs, they go, unfortunately, unfortunately, they, that's our system, but they're totally incompetent. It's overblown. I mean, you can get rid of, you know, like Elon Musk went in and got rid of 90% of Twitter. And it's still operating good. I mean, if a real president could go in and just dump, you know, at least half to three quarters, we have like four. Uh, what did uh, okay? We have forty-four, over forty-four four-star generals and admirals in the Pentagon, and we have like a million and a half, maybe a million, a million point two soldiers. In World War Two, we had twelve point over twelve million soldiers and seven four stars. Now, of course, there wasn't much technology. Okay, so, yeah. But most of these four stars, they're theorists. They haven't been on the battlefield. And that's why the American army, yeah. We, we are a paper tiger right now. I must say, we are almost defenseless. And all, we can't, all these, I mean, if Trump got in, or even RFK, whoever gets in, if they're any good, right away, you fire almost the entire, you know, top level and you uh, in, in the military and you pr- you find out who among the captains and the majors, and the colonels, should take their places. They should all be thrown out. We can't. Okay, right now we gave all the Howard to ammunition to Ukraine. <laughs> we can't make enough. We can only make enough each month in America to supply Zelensky for three days worth. So what, not that we should supply. I'm not saying we should. I think it's a bad thing. You know. When Putin said that there were Nazis, he off this guy, Stephen Bandera, Nazi ethnic cleanser. He killed hundreds of thousands of people in Ukraine before, you know, years ago, just like in, in Yugoslavia, the ethnic cleansing. And these guys, I mean, the oligarch who funds Zelensky is the same guy who funds the Azov neo Nazi. They wear swastikas and it's even here in America. They have camps, you know, with, it's, it's like the Fourth Reich, you know. And so there's no, there's no, the, that uh, Zelensky has has destroyed all his internal opposition. It's a Nazi state there. They're using the Jew. He's like a, what we used to call the Juden, right? You know, the Jews that helped in the concentration camp. That's Zelensky. 
He's a guy who's, who, who played the piano with his penis. You know, he was a comedian. Who the hell is he? What the hell? And 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 and, dumb, and actually, he was a pretty good guy. He was pretty funny. I watched some, but you know. W, our, our other idiot president, Bush president, you know, calls him the Churchill of our time. What an insult to, to Churchill. You know, so the whole thing is, it's, we're being led, you know, the, the um, it's like it was a movie, uh, uh, King of Hearts or Queen of Hearts, so it was a movie, an anti-war movie done in the 60s, I think. And the insane have taken over the asylum. We're being run. The people, the, our leaders uh, in America and in uh, in uh, UK. I'm going. I love the UK. I'm there a lot. And in Europe, EU, they're 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 all stupid. <laughs> they're they're, they're, told, they're destroying. They're self destructive. They're destroying everything. So you're. They're making. They. Yeah. Just... We made Russia stronger. Yeah. No. Just gonna... The last two years, Russia's stronger than it was before. I was, I was going to say, so your, you your somewhat response to that, which I think is perhaps very, very rational um, to why people like Epstein have had to get involved in funding science is that government has just been incompetent in so many ways. They're, uh, not, not they're, so, they're stupid. It's like, it's like, it's like a, a bunch of retards. And just look how they, I mean, you just, I mean, they can't do anything. Yeah. I mean, so, so, I, you know, and it's because, and partly where we respond, you get the, it because people like me don't want to go into government. But, you know, right? it, it's usually the case that brilliant people would rather stay outside and work in the private sector. So I don't blame you, yeah, of course. nor do I blame the, the you know, a group of other people who are, who are just as brilliant. So, you know, just to return somewhat to your biography, because I feel as if we've covered some of the things that I think you have an extremely interesting opinion on. Um, so you're now at SRI, right? You've just found out about Yuri Geller. Oh, back, back then. Yeah, back so then. Back. Oh, you want to? Oh, you want to go back? Okay, so back to your biography. We we sort of, you know, Jack, you know, I I would like to say to the audience, Doctor Sarfati has very interesting perspectives on a lot of things. So I thought it'd be interesting to pick your mind on yeah. some some of your beliefs on that. But um, so SRI, you meet Yuri Geller. You're back from Trieste. Um, no, I don't meet Yuri Geller at SRI. I don't meet him. No, at SRI. No, wait a minute. And this, uh, this you know, you, you've um, jumbled the timeline. And that's all, I'm only there for 17 hours, like a, a job, you know, I'd be like being debriefed. Yeah, I'm with, I'm with Brendan, I'm with uh, Put Off and Tog and other people I don't remember. And um, and they asked me to, well, they know I'm going to England and to Trieste. They already knew everything. They knew everything I was doing, right? It's all CIA. They want me to try to arrange tests of Uri Geller at the University of London. And it's just, okay, which happened. I used Fred Wolf help on that. So, so that's what happened there. Um, I didn't, and then I met Geller a year later at the test that I helped to arrange at the University of London. That's where I met Geller. Okay. And, and what? Um, the test that you were arranging at the University of London. What's that? What was the test that you were arranging at the University of London? Well, look, that, that you should read the Hippie State Physics. And uh, in fact, there's a John Hasted online. John Hasted has published a detailed description of what all the different tests. Uh, Arthur Kessler was there. Arthur C. Clarke was there. A lot of famous people there, and uh, and what went on. Um, so. Uh, yeah, they were trying to see. Uh, he may have cheated. Who the hell knows? I, a lot going on. Okay. So basically, I was commuting back and forth between Trieste. This is 1973, 74. Between Trieste, uh, Paris, and London. In Paris, I was staying with Fred Allen Wolf, who you know, the guy from San Diego, and. Uh, Oh, I'll skip the, the fun stories there, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll, oh, yeah, then we met. Okay, so then we, uh, <clears throat> Bob Tobin, the guy was, tell, tell you, he comes over to Paris. And uh, Brendan O'Regan, you know, the guy from the CIA comes on, is over there too. And, and then we're staying in London, um, 
I'm going back and forth and there's a very wealthy American woman who's living in London. And we stayed at her house, I guess in Holland Park, I think it was. And she had like an Olympic sized swimming pool in the basement. You know, it's like, like, like one of these super rich, rich, uh, you know, patrons of. And, um, and then the, we, um, let, let's see what was happening. Um, yeah, and, and, and okay, and so what a, and one of my trips to, to London, Brendan is there. Brendan comes over, this rich woman, uh, and also Bob Tobin and Fred Wolf. And we're taken to meet this 80 year old man named Carlos Suarez. Carlos Suarez is a famous guy. He uh, was born in Alexandria, Egypt, and he was. Uh, uh, He's, he was close friend of Lawrence Durrell, if you ever know about the Alexandria Quartet, book by Durrell. There's a thing, but he was the, his, he was the character Balthazar in, in the Alexandria Quartet. Kabbalist into the Kabbalah, but he's also an artist, like a Picasso, famous guy, because he, they even, even though he was born from Alexandria, he was in you know, uh, France for a long time, and his, some of his poetry is, was taught in the French schools. And you know, he's a close friend of uh, uh, Sartre, the Sartre, uh, Anis Nin. Uh, uh, he was a roommate for a while for Henry Miller. I know Henry Miller down and out in Paris and London. And, um, and also uh, Krishnamurti, Krishnamurti of the, the mystic. And uh, so in any case, if you read the, the Alexander Quartet, you know, it's, it's about basically the uh, the Mossad, or what's it called, the Mossad. You know, there's all this in, you know, spooky MI5, it's a spy story, too. So the point is that, um, well, it's very interesting, even though Carlos was Jewish, he's a Jew, right? But during the Nazi occupation in Paris, the Nazis didn't bother him. And he was a little, I gotta explain where he lived. In Paris, there is the there's the Eiffel Tower, the famous Eiffel. The Eiffel Tower is on the Champ de Mars, and you know the Champ de Mars is big green parade ground, and there are two uh, sidewalks, you know, cement sidewalks, you know, with benches. It's a park, but if you're crossing the, the bridge over the Seine toward facing, going toward the Eiffel Tower. On the left-hand side, the corner is a, is a very tall, has some nice buildings, you know, or old buildings, multiple apartment buildings. And there's this like narrow, tall building, I don't know, six floors, eight, 10 floors, whatever. And there's a penthouse at the top. And that penthouse was Carlos Suarez's place, okay? And throughout World War II, even the Nazis were occupying he was still there doing his spy, whatever he was doing, because I think they probably had, you know, they had agents, MI6 agents in the Nazi, you know, in the army, in the occupation army. Protect. So there's a whole kinds of cloak and dagger stuff going on with Carlos Suarez. <laughs> so, uh, so we got to know Carlos and we would go there. And he was like giving us Hebrew lessons. He was saying, you know, the Kabbalah, he wrote all these. In fact, in fact, if you look at his books online, there's a book called The Cipher of Genesis, and there's a book called The Sefer Yetzira, and in that, he talks about, there's a footnote about Jack Sarafati and Fred Allen Wolf are the physicists who are going to crack the Bible code. Here we go. And his thing, with it, this is actually pretty interesting. His thing was that the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, the Genesis in the Hebrew Bible, is a code, you know, from the extra from the time to whatever they are, you know, from from Yahweh. But Yahweh, okay, the Hebrew Yahweh God is, is an extraterrestrial, right? He's like right, like Zeus, and always said it, yeah. And in there is actually a, a physics code. My time, everything I'm doing right now, it's a physics code. And that um, our mission is to uh, decode 
Okay, I was in it. And, and he would say certain things, and I was kind of half paying attention. Fred was really into it, because Fred's into the Hebrew letters and all that stuff. I wasn't. But I was like half sleepy, you know, sort of like osmosis, you know, so yeah. But we would go there several times. We were there about maybe a dozen times, now six times, I forget. That. Fred actually wrote a book about it. And so, but he did say a couple of things. There are two things. He said, Jack, you're going to smash the wall of light. The wall of light's the light code of Einstein relativity. It's a smash, you know, that's fast, that's like the Alkyberry warp drive, right? That's what smash the wall of light. Then he would draw these things like two arrows, like heaven and earth, heaven and earth, and an arrow coming down, the light and an arrow going up. It's a two-way thing. And that's post-quantum mechanics. That's actually a nice image of uh of how I solved the, the consciousness problem. So the two things he said are exactly the same, actually, as George Cooper saying, Jack, there are two things the CIA wants you to know, wants to know, how does consciousness work? And that's this, this heaven and earth thing, which is mind matter, you know, you know spirit matter, you know, sort of thing. The two way street, and if you read Pavel Pilkin's review paper, The Brain as a Quantum Measuring Device, which came out in December 22. It's online. Section 7 is the Jack Sarfati post-quantum theory, which explains in terms of Bohmian, pilot wave is, you know, the information wave, the, the mind, and uh, the, the Bohm particles, uh, the matter, and the two-way street, the, uh, which, which is absent in ordinary quantum mechanics. See, quantum mechanics has the uh, only one arrow, and I mean, the back cache is the second arrow. In any case, uh, so everything Carlos was saying at the time in 1974, 374, I didn't, you know, just didn't mean much to me. But uh, now in hindsight, I see what? Sorry, Jack, just to interject right there, because I think it's an important yeah. tangent. You, you've mentioned this, and, and a lot of people have mentioned this in the past as well, this concept of a post-quantum physicist. Do you mind explaining, because, you know, to some people, it's sort of a new idea. Do you, do you mind explaining what, what defines a post-quantum physicist? Yeah, very precise. To get a beautiful, popular description of it, Pavel Pilkin's paper, The Brain as a Quantum Measuring Device, December 1922, major paper. No, this is a big professor from, from Finland and Sweden. He explains the Jack Sarfati concept, and I'll quickly. This special, okay, for, it's exactly like in relativity. In Einstein's classical relativity, you have special relativity and general relativity. The big difference, special relativity cannot explain the gravitational field because space-time is like a field, space-time continuum, acts on matter without matter back reacting on space-time. In other words, space-time is, is rigid. Can't do it. So in, in Newton's theory, space-time is the arena or the stage on which you know matter moves and stuff like that. Okay. But you can but matter cannot affect space-time. Now, what does it mean to say that space-time moves matter? What that means is that's called the geodesic, that if they're in the absence of electrical forces, if you just have a neutral particle, it follow, it moves in a without acceleration. It moves in a straight line and you know everything's flat. It's Euclidean geometry, there's no gravity. A free particle will move in a straight line without excel at uniform velocity. Right. And that's called a, that's that's a, a, a the simplest example of what we call now in general relativity, a time-like geodesic. Weightless, there's no weight, there's no gravity. It's like, it's like the astronauts floating in space, there's no gravity. Okay, so special relativity. What Einstein took 10 years of struggle and what he finally realized is that any matter acts back. Okay, so let's just go to, in terms of Carlos's, oh, wait a minute. Oh, you don't want me, oh, you don't want me to go on the screen because I could do this, I could draw it, okay. So we'll, but, we'll, but, we'll get into the- oh, Carl, Okay, in terms of Carlos's, Carlos's thing, Two levels, heaven and earth, okay, heaven and earth, heaven, earth, right? Zap, that's, you know, that's one of the hours, right? The lightning, zap, you know. 
that is the action in terms of relativity theory, that is the action of space time on matter. This would be matter, the lower level, right? Matter. So matter is not, you know, space time, matter is moving in a in a straight line without accelerating. That's the geodesic. You have to, no electrodynamics or anything. That's just simple. Okay. So that's one arrow. No gravity. What I say that he could back action, action reaction, in a more general sense than momentum conservation. Matter go reacts back on space time. That's my coupling. That's G over C to the four. You know, I was talking about before, right? So that's and that that's gravity. So that's ma energy matter bends space time, and that's the gravitation, the real gravitational field. This fake gravity too. We're not going to talk about that. Okay. So, so that that so that's general relativity. Einstein's big insight was restoring the generalized for every action is a reaction, but in a much more general philosophical, ontological, whatever you want to meta, metaphysical sense. Okay. What 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 Letty Susskind, I think, would call an organizing principle. Action reaction is an organizing meta principle. So what distinguishes classical special relativity from classical general relativity with gravitation is this reaction, back action of matter on space-time itself, and that is what gravity really is. Exactly the same thing happens in quantum form. This, this is when the CIA, when George Koopman says in 1975, Jack, CIA wants to know how consciousness works. So, and, you know, that's in the back of my mind, or well, whatever the field, the destiny, whatever is working, you know. <laughs> and in 1993, 1994, I'm in San Francisco, and I walk into a place called a clean, well-lighted place for books, a bookstore. And I walk in, I'm looking, I look at the books, and I see a book, The Undivided Universe by David Bohm and Basil Hyland. A little said, oh, look at that. But yeah, who I have been working with them. I knew them, okay. Bohm had died. I think he died in 93. And Basil, you know, he left the, the book unfinished. He was working with Basil Hiley. And I think Basil sort of, you know, finished the last touches of the book. It's kind of like Mozart and so on. Whatever. Okay. And so I pick up the book and the book opens up. I mean, it's like random, right? So, yeah, this, well, but Arthur Kessler calls this a library angel. But, you know, there's like, this is this is part of the high stranger. So oh, but the, uh, I think page 30, and, and Bohm is saying that, uh, see, in Bohm, they have the duality. They have a pilot wave. The quantum wave function is a physical field that really exists. But in addition, they have classical matter. So it's the same thing. The pilot wave is like space-time. And matter is the same for both relativity, you know, and 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 Bohm's version of quantum theory, which is not Bohr's Copenhagen. It's very different conceptual. See, Bohr, Copenhagen, they don't they they only have a wave function. They don't have the matter level, the classical matter. The wave function somehow collapses and makes classical world, which is all bullshit. That's, it's stupid. But anyway, that's what most people, most idiots in physics, that's what they believe because they don't they don't you know. They're, they're, the Bohmian, what I'm saying is a minority point of view, although it's getting more and more popular now, it's changing, the things are changing. But, but all right. So, because most physicists believe in Copenhagen, which says that there's only wave functions, there is no other thing, so they can't even conceive of what I'm talking about. See, that's the other thing. They can't even, they can't even think about it, it's not even their minds. No, there's no possibility of them thinking of it because they don't even know they're the two levels. And somehow they think duality is bad. It's got a bad rap. Can't have Cartesian duality. Oh, that's no good. They're stupid. Of course it's good. It works. So the point is that, uh, so the point is, so what 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 uh, Bohm says in that book there, and he says in two different places, but I just happen to see the first thing, the first thing I see is this, and it says, well, there's a violation of the action-reaction principle. In, the whole reason that quantum theory works in the, is because the wave function moves particles, what's called the Bohm quantum potential, is like a quantum, even in the absence of electrical forces or any, and even the absence of any other force. The, the quantum waves itself, it's called the pilot wave, the pilots the motion of the particles, okay? 
but there's no back reaction of the particle on its own wave, which would be like a nonlinear. That would be exactly just like in general relativity, where gravity is a nonlinear set of partial feedback loops, no feedback loop. Okay. So as soon as I saw that, I said right away, I solved the problem. There, yeah, bang! I, I saw instantly the solution to the problem. That you know, that George Koopman, you know, twenty years earlier, wanted to be with. Because we already knew that Bohr and already remember I said I was reading uh, uh, Bohm at uh, in 1958 at night at the Cornell synchrotron where I was uh, reading about where Bohm saw how Bohr says quantum waves the analogy of thought that that the in other words mind is, is a quantum thing some in some thing and, and they, even Henry Stapp they all kind of say that but a very vague uh, Penrose says it too but he has you know. Penrose is you know, saying basically what I'm saying, but with he sort of has an actual reaction, but he has gravity collapse. He doesn't really say it the way I say it. Okay. And um, so I start right away, bang, that's it. Consciousness. So what's what, what our consciousness is, the mind, the wave function, but you have to have a giant wave function, like a superconductor, you know, we are giant wave functions. We're, we're what I call room temperature biological superconductors. This is for this is the whole thing here, like late. Yeah. So, so what the what Jack Sarfati, what's talking to you now is a giant coherent wave function attached to the brain, I mean, there's God knows where, and talking to your giant wave function. Okay, we're two wave functions, and we're manipulating these pot, these quantum waves that uh, they, they are jiggling the electrons and the microtubules, which is creating the sound. You know, there's a whole kind of thing there, you know, uh, the hammer off stuff. And, um, so I saw it instantly right away, bang, because I knew about general relativity. Hey, it's just like, it's exactly the same as general relativity. And, you know, the Carlos Suarez, it's the two arrows. It's the second arrow, you stored it. So everything that Carlos Suarez was saying there, yeah, and he was just saying, okay, now wait, so there's a whole other thing now. This goes back even deeper now. So I solved the, I basically solved the problem. That's the solution to the problem. That's what, and you know, it's gotten more refined over the years, but this is basically, if you go now to this respectable paper by this big professor, Pavel Pilkin, this Finnish guy who teaches in Helsinki and somewhere in Sweden, he's funded by the Feds. You know, he's, he's part of the establishment. So he's legitimized, finally. He's now, and he's done a very nice job explaining to the cognitive, you know, to the mainstream, what the hell I'm trying to tell you. You know, you read that. It's a nice discussion. So this is now... Kosher. I'm talking. It's kosher. Okay. Oh. It's halal. It's halal. Okay. Halal. Um, all right. So I solved the damn problem. That, but that's what this. Okay. Now, once you know that, you see, this is not just philosophical. Once you know that, using nanotechnology, using nano, using what I call artificial neural nets at the nano level, we can, you know, if, if hammer office, right, we can start now. In the laboratory, actually making these nanoscale. Uh, what we say? Let's see what happens now. The, the in my M1, the M1 chip in my Apple computer is like five nanometer scale now. The M3, the, the M3 that Apple's coming out is going to be two or three nanometers. What I'm talking about, maybe already at that level we can do it. Excuse me. We could maybe use Apple technology or whatever. The you know two to three nanometer. So, yeah, because that's what the microtubules are like 10 nanometers. Yeah, microtubules and uh, the protein dimers, yeah, about two nanometers. We're now uh, approaching, we can make artificial micro to artificial, uh, what are called quantum dot uh, neural nets. In fact, in Russia, they're doing this guy named Mikhail Otelsky is publishing papers on it, this theoretical. And there's Yaka Aharonov has also published papers on it. So, this is a, you know, this is a known thing. So, we can test it, but we can actually start making chips that when we pump them uh, with energy, just like the, we do, like the metabolism, the microtubules, I'm claiming we're going to generate consciousness in these artificial, uh, in these, I call them post quantum computers. So, the quantum computers with this additional, because of the reaction of the electrons, uh, and the quantum dots, the meta atoms, they're also meta materials, the meta atoms, the reaction. The two-way street action reaction. So, nonlinear. It's a feedback control loop. Okay, 
that we can make uh, so we can make these artificial brains, basically uh, conscious brains, artificial ones. And the way you would know, you see what you would do. You you first have this this neural net, this artificial neural net, and and it's it's unconscious. It's not, we're not gonna we're gonna just let it operate at room temperature. You know, just like you train it, whatever, just like they're doing with the chat AI and all that stuff you do, you know, the pattern recognition, you do all that stuff, right? So you do that, you see how it performs, all right? Then you switch on the juice. You know, it's like Frankenstein's rolls a switch. It's alive, you are. It's alive, <laughs> okay? And you resin, you have to pump the right frequencies, you know, the right voltages, into the thing and up oh, wakes up if I'm right. You know, you know like woke up the consciousness becomes conscious. Here I am. You know. And then you give it the same tasks you did before you did that. This is like a Turing test, right? This is an empirical thing to do. And you give it and you see, you just now see how does it behave differently. See how it behaves differently. So what I say, it's going to behave qualitatively different. Sort of like an animal would behave. Like how many times, how many millions of times you see these cars that are going around Google and you know, all the, these, these things going around uh, Elon Musk, you know, with the self-driving cars training it, right? So it doesn't run in. Uh, by the way, I just the other the other day it, it all screwed up and you know it blocked the interstate, didn't know what to do because it was construction, it couldn't figure it out, right? Okay. So how many times do you have to go, how many millions of times do they have to train these things, right? So now, if Elon Musk wasn't such an asshole, then listen to me. Okay, Elon, I, I, I love what you're doing. Yeah, I love you, but you're an asshole too. And um, Elon would start paying attention to what I'm trying to say right here and start experimenting in his Tesla cars. You know, start doing, you know, he could fit. They, his engineers, they, they, could, they could do what they want. It's pretty straightforward. You know, because people are writing papers on this stuff. You know, the papers are artificial neural nets at the end of you know, and and uh, find the resonances, start experimenting, and stick them in the cars and see how the cars operate. You know, or whatever other things that you know, not only or autonomous drones, right? And, and, I mean, it's get dangerous because we're talking about sky now. We're also about terminating, right? If this thing, this thing is really conscious and doesn't like us, it can kill us. So, so this is a real issue. But these issues are real. So we're very close. But this is exactly what the CIA asked me to work on and what basically, you know, they supported me to work on. There's the solution. I've solved, you know, when I say solved, the conceptually, you know, we solved, we, we understand it. It doesn't mean I know how to get into the lab. I'm not nanotechnologist. And, you know, put the, you know, it's a, I'm, I'm not uh, Edison, you know, or uh, I'm not, you know, uh, an engineer. Yeah, but, so uh, just way I and didn't go in and, and build a nuclear reactor. He didn't make the bomb. He built equations, all right? So, right. so that, we, that problem is a that's a done deal, man. That's a, and that was that part of the what Carlos was saying. So in some the other sense, part, yeah, just to yeah, go ahead. just just to summarize, sort of the what defines a post quantum physicist. In some sense, what you're saying is that um, the understanding that that action reaction happens even at the quantum limit is what defines the understanding of that is what defines someone who is a post quantum physicist. Um, is that would that would that be correct? Would that be accurate? I'll say that again. I need, I need to say it again. So you mentioned the sort of the action reaction principle that you that you came up with. Um, you're, what you're saying defines a post quantum physicist is an individual that understands that that understands that that action reaction principle applies even at the quantum limit. Yes, and that and the same action, the same general action reaction principle that explains gravity also explains consciousness when it's applied. To, to the quantum theory. It's an extension, natural extension. It extends quantum theory in the same way that it extended special relativity, general relativity. In fact, they're, they're parallel. Yeah, ex yeah. So in, I fact, th ER, in fact, you know, Lenny says it's ER equals EPR. The ER, the ER is uh, the wormholes, you know, the, or the warp drive. The gravity is the ER, gravity ER. The EPR is this, this stuff we're talking about. Yeah, the Einstein and, uh, Rosenbridge. Yeah. Um, so, 
Okay, so we'll get into some of that because that's the real juicy yeah. stuff. I, yeah, well, what... but we can, we'll come back to that the next one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that's... There's a lot more to say about that. Yes, yeah, so I, just touch, I just think that's... Touch, touch, touch. I think that's where sort of the, the technical nuts like myself um, really enjoy themselves. So we'll, 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 we'll get back, back to that, but just to get back to sort yeah. of your biography and build up to 2017. So, you know, you, you've met this um, Kabbalist now and this Kabbalist is showing you um, a book and he claims that it's a code um, and he claims that yeah. you will be the person that cracks it. Where do we go from yeah. there? Okay, and and I, I was like, that, oh, oh, at one point, oh, my boy, there's more about this guy. Henry Miller wrote a book, 100 essays, 100 short essays. And, and in that book, there's an essay about Carlos Suarez when he's living with Carlos Suarez. And he claims that Suarez was the head of a French secret society that existed for a thousand years. It goes back to the Knights Templar. The Knights Templar. This is like Dan Brown, Angels and Demons, exactly. But this is way before. This is 19. This is the. Uh, oh, wait. When Henry Miller wrote this, maybe in the 60s. You know, I had the book. I lost the book. I can't find that damn book. But he says, and he says that the way they did it, and there are all these historical characters in French history, in French, you know, that goes back, famous pe uh, people, maybe Voltaire was, in, you know, people like that, uh, Rousseau, and, you know, they're, they're like the, you know, the famous French, this is all French culture, right, the highest level. And that the way they did it was that um, they would cert say certain key phrases which would stick in the brains. This is exactly what Carlos did to me. The two things, you know, the arrows and smashing the wall of light, light come. There it is. That's exactly what, yeah. I read this in Henry Miller years after this happened. And I said, this is, oh, that's it. Okay. And then at one point, I'm there. And Carlos, he's had a little guy. He's like Yoda. A little bit like Yoda in, you know, in, in Star Wars, okay. And at one point, he turns in and he, Puts his hands on you know, my shoulder. He looks at me, you know, says, You don't know it yet. You will not come into your power until you're with the woman and the child. But you are heir to the tradition. I know what the hell he's talking about. But see, the woman and child is an allusion to Mary Magdalene and the, and the baby Jesus. This is whole damn, this is whole, this whole kind of thing here that he's a, you know, I'm being, also my name, Sarfat, Sarfati. My name in Hebrew is King's Earth, King's Land, King's Land, Tsar as in Caesar, as in Tsar Duke, goes way back ancient to Babylonian, the Tsar of Russia, an Israeli guy, it's the Frenchman. So my name's Safati means the Frenchman, which goes back to this guy named Rashi. You see, you have to know, there's a book called <clears throat> Holy Blood, Holy Grail, which is allegedly about my ancestors, this guy named Solomon Hazafati, where you're aware of this. And there's other, I don't know if we have time to go, this is a whole bunch of other things. You have to read my book, Best Destiny Matrix. So there is, this is the occult, this is a cult thing. And the woman and the child, it was like the you know symbolic of, Ma of Mary Magdalene and into Jesus. Uh, is, is the woman I'm with now has a son, you know, as a child. You know, I mean, it's now years I'm with her, almost 30 years. And the thing is, as soon as I met this, my current lady for th almost 30 years, 27 years, this guy, it's a long time. Um, you know, like the final one of them, but um, you know, uh. That's when I got it, really got into my power, you know, in terms of even money and influence, you know. So it's like, the gold, good luck, child. I can't get rid of her. It's exactly what he said. So there's a lot more to this than meets the eye. And there's something, uh, I don't know if we have time, there's something else about this that's very, okay, do we have, do you want to go into this other thing that's related to this? All right, so that was in 1973 that happened, right? 
Yeah, okay. So it's now it's, it's, it's um, oh, okay. Okay, let me because I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to flip back to, but let me go. It's 1980, and I'm in the Hilton Hotel in San Francisco at a meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and John Wheeler is there. And um, there's this, this is the, the famous, it's written, you can read about this. I think it's in How the Hippies Save Physics, actually, by David Kaiser. It should be. And uh, Wheel is there. Wheel is giving a talk against Dory Geller about the, the, all the paranormal stuff. It's, it's Holcomb, you know? He's like defending the, <laughs> being, his, being an asshole. Wheel, he's a nice guy for being an asshole. And I'm there for that meeting. And there's this guy named Marcello Tuzzi, who's a, who's a friend of, uh, of uh, Oh, okay. Well, okay. So I'm there, and it's between the meetings, and people are like milling around, you know, coffee with name tags. This guy walks up to me. His name is David Padua, a little bit older than me. And he says my name, Sarfati. And he says, Are you related to uh, Margarita Sarfati? I said, Yeah, I'm a, my, you know, just a, I didn't know her, of course. Margarita Sarfati, she's a famous woman in Italian history. I went, yeah, it's, I won't do it then. Just look her up, Margarita Sarfati. And a cousin of my grandfather, just another, not a close relative, but we're related. And he says, I've traced our, says, the Bible says he's a cousin, he's a cousin. And he traced our family line back a thousand years. And I said, that's interesting. But then the bell rang back time to the meeting, and that was it. So I didn't, didn't see it. Some time goes by, about a month. I'm walking into the Cafe Trieste in the you know, Italian, I live in the town section, North, North Beach, famous Cafe Trieste where Francis Ford Coppola wrote The Godfather. All that. Well, the big poets, you know, Kerouac on the road, all these guys hang out there. And that was my hangout at the time. And this guy, Dave Massetti, <clears throat> walks in. He says, Jack, I have a letter for you. Letter, Jack Sarfati, care of North Beach Ma uh, Magazine, San Francisco. I, don't know. I open up the envelope. It's this guy, David Padlow, who I met. He says, he says, Jack, it's a long letter. He said, the weirdest thing happened to me after I met you. After the meeting, he walked into North Beach and there were these two bookstores on Broadway in Columbus, one of the books that was called Discovery Bookstore. It turns out this guy, he lived in, in, in Albuquerque. He's a very rich guy. He made a lot of money. He did something, uh, some electrical patent thing. He sold it to Xerox, made a fortune, and then got into, he, he had a company in Albuquerque, New Mexico, called Agri Genetics Corporation, doing genetic engineering of, you know, seeds and stuff like that. He was one of the early pioneers. I just, his name is David Padua, P-A-D-W-A, -A, okay? <clears throat> and he said, because, you know, the company, he was a genetic engineer, sort of stuff in the early, just 1980, right? And he said he was looking for a book called My World Line, uh, a pop science book by um, George Gamma. You know, one, two, three, infinity, George Gamow. Uh, and the book was out of print. And he couldn't find the book. Okay. He walks into Discovery Bookstores on it, looking, you know, the science book. There it is, a copy, a used copy of My World Book. Buys the book. Goes out of the store, and right across the road there is Lauren Sperlinghetti City Lights Bookstore. Another big bookstore. He walks in there. He turns, and first thing he sees, now this is pretty weird, man. First thing he sees on the magazine rack is North Beach Magazine, and the cover picture is me, Jack. And it's a great picture. It's actually the picture is in How to Be Safe Physics. It's a picture of me, and I'm holding the book, My World Line. The book he just bought that he was looking for. I'm holding it in this picture. Okay. So how do you explain that? Okay. 
She said, she said Jack, this is, I, I just kind of let you know this is what happened. Gets even more. So get this. So, so now, so I'm reading the letter. And then walks in Gregory Corso, the poet, the beat, famous beat poet, Gregory Corso, who's like hanging out, staying, actually staying out, like camping out of my place, actually. Hey, this guy, um, uh, David Glasso, just wrote the book about time travel, and his book, you know, The Great Race, which everybody's get. Go on, go on Kindle and just download for five or six bucks. It's called The Great Race. David Glasso is the latest stuff about Jack Sarfati and everything we're talking about. Okay. And I say, hey, Greggy, look at this letter I got. And Greggy starts reading it. It turns out that Padua is not only a friend of Corso's, is a patron who gives Corso, who gave Corso, who took care of Corso in Greenwich Village. Padua used to fund or give money to all these, you know, the beat, the beat, Kerouac, all these poets. Okay? This is pretty weird, right? And, and uh, uh, of course, so he talks like this. You know, he, he has that, that. He talks like this. This kind of the, uh, the New York, it's like a thug. He was, he was, he's like, he was it's kind of a thug. You know? He says, uh, he says, uh, he says, hey, Padma, you know, Padma, he's CIA, Padma. That's <laughs> crazy. That's crazy. So, what are you talking about? What, what do you mean, Greg? He says, uh, yeah, you know about Ram Das? You'll be here now, the book Ram Das, and they're in India. And Ram Das is with this guru up at the top of the mountain. And this rich American comes and his Land Rover Defenders, Land Rover. And that was Padua, man. That was David Padua. And the guru says, give me your Land Rover. And Padua gives him the Land Rover. This is already, you got to read this with Ram Das, okay? Like, and then he says, yeah, it was Padua. Padua, he brought the Dalai Lama from Tibet for the CIA over to America. It's my cousin, David. <laughs> and then I'm told, uh, when somebody told me, you know, when Gregory died, I don't know, 20 years ago, Padua, uh, you know, took care of him. My cousin took care of him, okay? So this is all very, very, come on, I couldn't be right. You know, this is talk about, okay, conspiracy. This is conspiracy theory on steroids, and it's all true. So so anyone who doesn't believe in an intelligent conspiracy, that the world is a conspiracy, okay? And you're asleep at the wheels. Like Gurdjieff, you know, you're you're. You're a fucking brain dead zombie. You might be a part of the zombie cop uh, apocalypse. You're just not flesh eating yet, but you probably will do that. You know, and, <laughs> yeah, I'm not trying to make you personally. You know what I mean? You know, it's like these progressives, these woke, they're into critical race theory, uh, white privilege, uh, God knows what, woke, transgender, cut your balls off, become a girl, be a woman, become a guy. This is so, I mean, this is so, fuck, this is so fucking crazy. Not only that, it's also. You know, talk about, you talk about Epstein? Okay, you are Epstein with the young girls? These doctors and whoever who are mutilating five-year-olds, 10-year-olds and taking the parents, you know, that, now that, that is, what is that? That's crime against children. That's that's worse than what Epstein did. Epstein, these girls, at least were 17, so they were just, it was all, you know, technical and they were willing. And they were, they're basically adults, and, you know, what, Girls 16, 17 is you know, more mature than most guys, right? I mean, so so what Epstein did is not as bad as what these medical people, these psychologists, and these woke a assholes, they should all be put in prison. You know what the, they were doing? When, when I grew up in, in Brooklyn, there, the, the fathers, they, 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 they take the baseball bats and, you know, bash their head. I mean, hate to say it, but this, you know, that is terrible what they're doing to these kids who don't know what, you know. In fact, now they, you know, so, so that's the real crime. You want to talk about crime. An Epstein. So how did I get into that? Well, <laughs> you know, it's this is sort oh, of the conspiracy. Conspiracy, yeah. Okay, so conspiracy. this is a wonderful sort of end in some sense. 
to a buildup from 1970s to somewhat the 1980s, mid 1980s. And what we'll do next time is sort of build it up from the 1980s, mid 1980s up until 2017, yeah. the modern story. And then we'll begin getting to some of the more technical equations and some of the things that are that are going to make this narrative. Yeah, you're going to have to do it more than you have to do a couple more because this is you know there's a lot of stuff and we can just I, we can even do it from London. Let's see. Oh, you're in, oh, in London. When I'm in London, it's less of a uh, here. It's like what is it? Uh, yes, eight well, hours? No, no. Oh, it goes three hours. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's more six hours. Yes. Yeah, so we'll, London six. We'll we'll talk about the details, but I think for the listeners, it's valuable to understand that. This is a biography of Dr. Jack Sarfati's life. And so we want to get deep into aspects of his life. This isn't just about um, some UFO alien um, um, yeah. narrative. This it's is also politics, politics, culture. This is politics. What's this is the world today? This is because the world, the world is in trouble right now. You know, the world is burning. Oh, by the way, one thing, one thing I just read in the, in the Wall Street Journal all these climate activists, global warming, it's bullshit. And the fires, they were actually, according to the Wall Street Journal, I think it's today, it's online, we're having fewer fires all over the earth than we've had before, even though it looks like, you know, the thing in Maui and stuff like that, you know, there are these, you know, cases. But you know this whole climate thing is, is is the climate. These climate activists, along with the transgender activists and the woke activists, all they're going to destroy everything. They're going to actually destroy the planet. They're, they're going to be responsible for billions of people dying. So this is a matter of survival. Yeah, because so, they're stupid. They don't in real real science. Yeah. So Jack, I think it's important that we get into those things, and perhaps you can you know help help people who are members of the lay public understand some of the more sort of physics-based thermodynamics principles that people use to model climate science. And I feel as if because people don't understand the modeling that goes behind climate science, they don't understand some of the more specifics. Um, and so it'd be interesting to get your perspective on that in the future. Uh, but this has been a wonderful- Well, you know what? Wait, wait. I'm, I, I can't say too much because I'm not a computer guy. That Creon Levitt, did you, did you, by the way, did you interview Creon? That's happening. Send me the link. I didn't see. That's, huh? that's happening tomorrow. That's tomorrow. Well, that's tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Creon is the expert on that sort of thing. I'm not. All yeah. I know is what people like Creon tell me. Okay. So I'm. So I don't want to say anything. I yeah. don't want to appear expert on climate modeling. I'm not. I, I don't know. You know, I'm not. I'm a, yeah. I'm a computer idiot. I don't know how to use my laptop. You know, to type. So I, I, you know, I think I think it's come through very evidently to people that you're a human. You have things that you care about. There are things that you're an expert on, like theoretical physics and models. Um, and yeah. those are things you can speak to as a matter of fact. But it's also interesting to get your opinions on things you're just generally interested in as an individual. Um, you know, you, yeah. in the world we live in today, you don't necessarily have to be an expert to opine. But it doesn't mean that your your voice in that um, sort of field should be taken as fact. Um, so I think it's worth yeah. it's worth, worth recognizing that. But Dr. It's an opinion. It's an opinion. It's an, it's an opinion based on a lot of experience. And and we're in a free country. Last I checked, we're in a free country. Opinions are allowed. Uh, not as free. We are not as free since Biden and the Democrat crazies took over as before. It says pre COVID, COVID has you know really uh, helped turn America into a totalitarian tyranny. We're not quite, you know, we're America, we're now the USSA. USSA, uh, the, U the United uh, Soviet States of, of America, I, and um, quickly we're quickly losing our uh, bill of rights, our freedoms, and um, if the election is stolen again in 2024, it's over, as, as far as I can see. I mean, we won't recover. So we'll see. What, we'll see what happens. That, that's also why I cannot ignore. Yeah. So the reality, because we are not living in a stable society. I mean, what happened in Ethiopia could happen here. You know, it's just a, it could easily happen here. Yeah. So I, I think you, you're very right in saying we're in, we're in extremely volatile times, and that's why these conversations matter than than ever before. And you're yeah. 
you're a very valuable voice um, in times like this. And so, Dr. Sarfati, I want to say with that, thank you, as always. General Sarfati, maybe. Um, Admiral, uh, Admiral. Admiral Sarfati. <laughs> Admiral, of the, Admiral of the fleet. Yeah. <laughs> Admiral, the, uh, the, this, all this, right, sometimes I think it's a little bit of Solomon. Solomon this, about, uh, I'm the monarch, the monarch of the sea. The monarch of the, the sea. The ruler of the king, maybe. Okay. <laughs> So this has been this, um, extremely, extremely oh. for me, and it's been a joy to sit with you today. Yeah. Um, okay, by the way, I do have, I meant to tell you before we uh, go, uh, I have all kinds of photographs of some of the things I'm talking about if you want to stick in some visuals. Let's okay. talk about that offline, maybe tomorrow. Let's talk about that. Uh, after, okay, after you do Creon, send me the link, and I'll, in the meantime, I'll gather some photographs that you sounds, may want to use. Sounds amazing. Okay, all right, good and okay. I, okay. I want you to stay on a little bit afterwards, but um, okay. for the okay for the listeners, this has been Dr. Jack Sarfati, um, an incredible scientist. Like I said, um, General Sarfati from now on is how we'll go to him, um, or Admiral Sarfati. Um, this has been amazing. It's always a joy, um, and thank you. There'll be episode three coming out soon. <laughs>